Welcome to the SureDog Radio Network preview for UFC Fight Night 236, Hermanson versus Pfeiffer, also known as UFC Vegas 86. I'm your host, Ben Duffy of SureDog.com. With me, as usual, is Keith Schillen, the executive producer of the SureDog Radio Network. Keith, how are you doing today? Uh, I'm doing good, man. It's a long day. I'm really tired. Uh, i got to be honest, I was at a uh, junior high wrestling tournament, uh, middle school states. So I'm super tired. <laughs> it's very draining, long. Uh, but I, before I, and I'll ask you how you do in a second. But uh, I want to give a shout out to uh, to all my boys. Uh, I think I actually might have had the stats wrong yesterday during the recap. Uh, but so my my son's team is a private team, so it's not a you know it's not like a you know middle school team. So we had kind of kids scattered all over different middle school. Uh, but we had uh, I think fourteen finalists. For the state in the state Ooh. championship, we have eleven champions. Uh, absolutely Ooh. incredible. We actually, it, 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 one of them was deceiving because we had two of our guys going against each other. So uh, you know, it is what it's worth. But uh, shout out to all my 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 boys in out there. So I'm very proud of them. I love those guys. So uh, way to crush it. That is incredible, man. Wow, what what a performance. Uh, <clears throat> How you doing, man? And- I'm doing all right. I I feel better than I sound. Uh, Those who watch the show regularly, you know, I've been fighting off a cold for a week. I have felt like I've been on the last day of this cold for like six days now. I feel okay, but my voice just sounds like garbage. So please do bear with me. Uh, We're looking at UFC Vegas 86, 14 fights culminating in a level up moment for Joe Pfeiffer, clearly one of the anointed sons of the promotion. He has the the backstory that we'll probably get to in a little more detail when we, when we get to his fights. Uh, and obviously he's a very exciting fighter. He's a fighter with considerable upside and promise uh, and he's fighting Jack Hermanson. So this short a time into his career, he's already taking on a ranked or recently ranked yeah. opponent. South of that, there are 13 other fights. Uh, I mean, I'll ask you, Keith, we just finished with uh, UFC Vegas 85. It's one that we both kind of said was thin on paper in the wake of the event you were a little higher on the in cage product than i was but at, at, at its best it was just another fight night how do you feel about this one yeah kind of the same um I, the, the main event is to me is so intriguing so i'm kind of graded on the curve you know based on mm-hmm. that i mean some of the other ones i mean it is what it is uh, there is a lot of fighters on here that may even be you know a little old in the tooth but that are still like some of my my favorite guys like Dan Ige and, and, and Andre Filia, kind of two guys that I've always really enjoyed watching. So I give it like a C. Like, uh, like I'll, I'll be entertained. I think, I, think, I think the main event is pulling it so up for me. So, yeah, I'll go with a C. Yeah, I, I can feel that. And Dan Ige, always a favorite of mine. Trevin Giles, you know, I'm down with the Houston guys. And even the undercard. And I said about last week's card, there are – 14 undercard fighters and only three of them are over 500 in the UFC here. There are 16 undercard fighters and only four of them are over 500 in the UFC, but down there, you've got surprising name value. You don't expect to see names like Devin Clark, Trevin Giles, even like Max Griffin and Jeremiah Wells clogging up an undercard. Sure. And then uh, Loma look boom me. Yeah. So, uh, there's some good stuff on here, and we're getting the rerun of the Rodolfo Vieira Armin Petrosian fight that was supposed to take place at UFC Sao Paulo last November. Uh, so yeah, th- there's some goodies here. Not a ton of divisional relevance. The question I I typically ask is who's closest to a title shot off of a win because of the hype and the promotional push behind them. It might be Joe Pfeiffer. And, um, yeah, no, I, I mean, it, I think it definitely is. I mean, who? Yeah. I mean, Jack Hermanson, I'm not looking at the UFC's rankings right now, but he's probably hovering around the 11, 12, 13 mark. If Pfeiffer beats him, he's looking at a ranked contender in his next yeah. fight. So it's probably him. Uh, and we'll get to whether that's too much too soon or he's the real deal uh, in an hour or two, but any other general thoughts on this one before we dive into the prelims? I, th- I think what you're looking at is, is not necessarily division or relevance, but just action, action, and maybe some storylines. I mean, the the Piper, you know, Piper stepping up and and facing a ranked opponent this 
early in his career. I've been such intriguing to see if he's ready for a tricky guy like Hermanson. Um, I I don't check the betting lines. I, I'm I'm I wonder who the favorite is. So, I'll quiz you on some of these because a lot okay. of them are close. Okay. Uh, this isn't. In fact, there are a couple of greater than two to one favorites, but only a few. Most of them are, are two to two to one or less. So I'll, I'll quiz you on okay. some. First up at UFC Vegas 86 is a men's bantamweight matchup between Daniel Marcos and Alrichi Lang. Marcos, the 30-year-old Peruvian, is a perfect 15-0 as a professional mixed martial artist. He is 2-0 since joining the UFC out of Season 6 of Dana White's Contender Series. Fought most recently at UFC London last July, taking a split decision over Davy Grant, a contentious one to say the least. I'm, I'm sure we'll talk about that in a moment, but by hook or by crook, he remained undefeated, and uh, he will look to stay that way against uh, Alrichi Lang. 30 year old Mongolian is 25 and 11 overall. He is three and three in the UFC. He is coming in off a win as well. He competed back in October at the Dawson versus Green fight night, where he took a unanimous decision over Johnny Munoz. Uh, here, Marcos is a pretty comfortable favorite. He's minus 230. I'll reach you lane plus 190. I, I'll go first here and say that. I might be leaning slightly Marcos here, but I'm not feeling that line. Uh, Marcos barely squeaked out a split decision over Davy Grant. And granted, yeah. pun, pun fully intended, granted, Davy Grant, we both think is a good and underrated fighter, very tough. Uh, yeah. But Crafty. yeah, I thought Marcos pretty clearly lost the, the second and third rounds there. And if he was 14 and one coming into this fight, you know, fought the exact same fight that he did, yeah. but the judges got it right. He right. would not be minus 230 tonight. Yeah, I agree. Uh, Al Ricci Lang, I, I do still think he's just another guy at 135, but that's more than I would have said about him at 125. At 125, he looked like a bust, uh, like a big, tall, skinny flyweight that fought at a furious pace, kind of reckless, but didn't have the gas tanker durability to make it work against UFC level flyweights he's moved up to 135 and he's reined that aggression in a little bit uh he's still a high pressure guy high motor guy uh still looks to counter but just his gas tank and his durability are both a little better up a weight class I, I think I mean he's still got absolutely lanced by Eamon Zahabi but that aside he seems more comfortable at 135 but I, I see this in terms of approach as a bit of a mirror match. Both guys tend to be kind of pressure counter striker types that want to bait their opponent in, into making a mistake. But I just think Marcos is a harder hitter, more athletic, more durable. So Alrichi Lang is actually a step down from Davy Grant. In my opinion, I think Marcos is going to have enough to take the decision here. Uh, I, I do think he's a, a harder hitter shot for shot. If one guy gets a knockout here, I think it's probably Marcos. Uh, so I'm with you. I asked you a fight or two ago, whether you were sold on Marcos and you were like, no, you know, he's just another guy in this division. He's just, he's undefeated because he hasn't run into the right guy yet. I tend to agree with you there, but I don't think I'll reach Lang is the right guy either. I, I got Marcos by decision here. Yeah. Um, I, <laughs> I actually like both these guys. I mean, again, you know, in this division, they're not going to win the title or anything like that. But I, I think they're both quality guys. Like, I'm slacking at my job again. Like, this fight being first to open up the card is really, a, a, you know, head shaker. If it depends on how you look at shaping a card. If you if you're shaping the card and, and you know the best fights last and and you kind of trickle down from there, then like, why is this fight opening the card? I mean, I thought maybe oh, must be, I wonder must be a timed you know, time zone thing with China. Then I looked it up and I'm like, this would be going at like 5.30 in the morning in, in China. So that, that didn't make but, sense. But it, but there must be something to that because the next fight, Fernie Garcia versus Haider Emil, that was going to be Shai Lan as well. So they were trying to cram the Chinese but, guys to the beginning of the card. Is, it, is, is that like a tradition in, in China? They get it like super early to watch fights. Like well, it's like, I like, picture yeah. China in the morning and I picture just, you know, like these huge formations of people doing like Tai Chi out in like the, the that's, square, yeah. maybe. Yeah, maybe that's what it is. <laughs> it's it. We're like we we watch at like 10 a.m. and they're like, no man, you gotta get, start off the day with violence. They, five five thirty, they're out yeah. there doing tai chi and watching like you know <laughs> <Yeah>. mediocre <laughs> bantamweights um, and featherweights. Yeah, I 
I, I like Marcus. So I think I'm a little higher on Marcus than you are. I, I, again, I mean, that division, that, that's, that's, you know, murder's row to go through. But, you know, he's a pressure striker that, that that does well to march down his opponents, very controlled pressure. Like, so, you know, he's not, he's not crazy volume, but, you know, he's pretty, pretty good volume. He's technically sound. He fights behind a high guard defense. I like his hands. I think it, I think they're quick. I like how he throws them. Everything's short and tight, accurate. Uh, good at uh, you know, kind of seeing and countering. Uh, I, I I love. It was two fights ago. I remember him throwing to spots when, when his opponent was, yeah, you know, he was pressuring his opponent. And you get the opponent got to the point where he's got to like dodge left or right, kind of like a like a like a goalie in, in soccer trying to guess where the where the uh, what do they call that the, what the, the free it's kick. not a really penalty kick. Yeah, it's not a really popular yeah. sport. So I don't think people would would know what I was talking yeah, about. Yeah, it's it's no. kind of a niche thing. Let, let's let's yeah. stick to you know like the big sports. You know. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I like that he just touches when there is, there isn't an opening. Um, he's got some he's got some pretty decent. Power. He's not like this huge cracker, but he yeah he's got some pop. Uh, I like that he rips the body. Not much of an offensive wrestler, but to his credit, like it, in key moments of the fight, he did take Davy Grant down, which could have won in the fight. Uh, but he's a weak defensive wrestler overall. Uh, Our Richie Lang. You know, this guy is. I mean, I mean, for for one night, Daniel Marcos was the best wrestler in England, right? Just you know, until <laughs> yeah. he got back on the plane and left, he's like, "Well, not if Mark DeCasey was in the in the <laughs> arena." Uh, D one DeCasey. Yeah, I, I, I Richie Lang. He, he's a he's a big guy for the division, which is funny that you know, moving moving in the division that he's he's still a big guy. Uh, he's he's long and lengthy. He's a solid striker. He's accurate. I, I like his power. Uh, I mean, he hurt Johnny Munoz a bunch of times in, in that fight. Uh, it really steps in his shots. He loves unloaded like uppercuts, uppercuts and hooks when he gets inside. I mean, going back to like the Jeff Molina fight, he hurt Jeff Molina, which at that time was like yeah, you know, he didn't win, but like that was the time was a was a was a good showing. Uh, good kicking game. Uh, he likes to close the distance by throwing flying knees, which I'm not crazy about. Um, he can wrestle a little bit, but like again, he took Jeff Molina down. Uh, he grinded Johnny Munoz in, into the clinch. Uh, he stuffed some takedowns from Cody Durden, though. Uh, I, I see his overall takedown defense is still kind of weak. Like Durden took him down five times, but Durden's a really underrated wrestler. Uh, if he ends up on top, he's got good ground. I mean, he beat up Cameron El- else from, from top, and he has the cardio go 15 minutes. I agree with you. I, I think it's a really fun fight. I think the line is off. Uh, I think it should be clo- much closer, closer to a pick em. I like both guys a lot. Yeah, you know, I think uh, you know Rich Lane doesn't have the best record in the UFC, but I think he's better than his than his, you know, his record indicates. I am going to go with Marcos. I just think he's the sharper striker. Uh, he he's got the overall moral weapons uh, with his kicks and 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 his the way he punches. He's faster, more accurate. He's got better volume. I, I see Marcos wins by decision. Next up on the UFC Fight Night 236 prelims will be the debut of Dana White's Contender Series alum, Hyder Emil. He has had a rotating cast of prospective opponents. First, uh, Shailan Nurdenbeka, then Melzik Bagdazarian. The wheel finally stopped spinning on the name of Fernie Garcia. So uh, that's the matchup we get. Garcia, 30-year-old, or sorry, 31-year-old now Texan, is 10-4 and overall. He is 0-3 since joining the UFC out of Season 5 of Dana White's Contender Series. He has dropped unanimous decisions to Journey Newsom, Brady Heastand, and Rinya Nakamura in those three appearances. The most recent of those, the Nakamura fight, was uh, back in August at the Holloway versus Korean Zombie uh, fight night. So, he will look to get his first win in the octagon here. Assuming he got the typical contender series contract, this might be his last chance to do so. And he's going to try to do it against Emil. A uh, 33 year old Californian is eight. No overall. He fought on the contender series last August, uh, taking a unanimous decision over Emra Somez. Uh, like I said, he had numerous opponents uh, fall through, but he gets Garcia here and he is a moderate favorite. Emil is minus 185, Garcia plus 160. Uh, okay, I'll say right off the bat, my my Texan bias is, is well known, although it, it fades quickly the further you get from Houston. Texas is a big place. Uh, Fernie Garcia is better than his record, but he still might not be UFC material. The the poor thing uh, the the thing about poor Fernie is <laughs> Man, he keeps you, losing. Can yeah. I ask you a question? Of course. What's the longest like is it 
the longer the drive, north south Texas, east west, like diagonal, like what's oh, if you had to east, go west. one point, well, east west he, is longer. Well, here we go. I'm in Houston, so if I drive uh 60 to 75 minutes east, I'm in Louisiana. Like I pass okay, through okay. Baytown, Beaumont, and I'm over the border okay, in Louisiana. So, okay, so and there's, there. yeah, there's drive through uh margarita machines right across the border, you know, nice. and alligators will eat you if you get out of your car. If I drive <laughs> west, that's <laughs> dope. Yeah. If I drive west on I-10, it's 12 hours to El Paso. Really? Like, like when my my wife and I moved away from Houston last time back in uh, 2010 and went to Salt Lake, we drove like a 12 hour day just because it would have felt so defeating to drive all day and still be in Texas. So we wow, drove from crazy. like 10 in the morning until like 1030 at night just to get across the border and get to a hotel in New Mexico, like right wow. across the border. I mean, Texas is big north to south, but it's huge east to west. It's a wow. 12 or 13 hour drive from one end <laughs> to the other. 13 hours, I could drive from where I live all the way to my my wife grew up in Canada and back. Oh, dude, I mean, I'm not a stranger to that. I grew up in the D.C. area. I'm like, okay, I can be in Philly in two hours. Uh, <laughs> traffic allowing, I can be in New York in four. I can be in Boston yeah. in like seven. Yeah. I, and yeah, now that's I'm, true. Yeah, I can drive like 11 like hours states. and I'm still in Texas. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, this is people like, man, I listen to this podcast. What do I so lucked to given the geography of Texas? But guys, sorry to interrupt you again. No, uh, poor Fernie. He keeps losing. He's competitive, but he clearly lost each of them. But you can argue that they've matched him harder every time out from Journey Newsom to Brady Houston to Rinya Nakamura. They're all kind of middling prospect guys themselves, but there's more upside each time. Uh, and Emil is another one right out of that batch. The problem with Fernie Garcia is he, he he's not super athletic, but he's come up with a an approach that worked for him at the LFA level. You know, he got a he's got a, a good motor. You know, boxing heavy. Uh, you know, boxing heavy approach. He's not a great athlete, but he's got decent power, and he maximizes his power by throwing pretty cleanly. Uh, you know, and again on. On the regional scene, just having one good weapon and the discipline to stick with it, he, you know, he's a longtime Fortis guy. That was plenty. You know, he, he cleaned up at the LFA level. Against UFC-level athletes, it hasn't been enough so so far. Emil is kind of an interesting opportunity because Emil is super raw. Uh, he's a much better athlete than Garcia. He hits harder. He's faster. Uh, if they get their hands on each other, I think he's probably going to be the physically stronger guy. Uh, but he's aggressive kind of wide open defensively uh you know he's a southpaw throws hard he's i mean he's undefeated so it hasn't cost him yet but he's i mean he's been in trouble on the ground in some of his fights even uh, on the the regional level his last fight in lfa was against chase gibson who's a pretty good fighter himself uh gibson fought in in bellator a couple times i think and Gibson was all over him in, you know, for stretches of the first round, had his back, was trying to choke him. Uh, Emil survived just on kind of toughness, good instincts, athleticism, but he's clearly not a finished product there on the ground. I'm leaning towards him here because just, I think he's going to catch Garcia, his power, like the power differential is going to be evident. But if this thing goes to the ground, Garcia's decent on the ground. And he could at least win rounds, you know, by keeping uh, Emil in trouble, kind of the way uh, Chase Gibson did. So give me Emil here by decision, but I don't have a whole lot of confidence in it. Uh, Emil might have solid upside in the UFC 145 pound division, but he is nowhere near a finished product. And he's raw compared to the other prospects that Garcia has been fighting. Yeah, dude, I, I, I don't get this pennant line again. Um, I'm. It's hard to get excited about Emil being a 33 year old UFC, you know, guy making his debut. Um, what I've seen of this guy, and again, I'll be honest, I, I, I did, I did, I did tape study, but a lot of times I was doing tape study, sitting in the bleachers, looking up at wrestling while like the film was going. So, um, I mean, he's an aggressive striker. He fights out of both stances, but he drops his hands. He's got good pop uh, in his strikes. 
he likes to close the distance and kind of make it a grimy battle on the clinch. He will look for takedowns, but he's not a great grappler. Uh, he's a weak takedown defense. He he is hard to hold down because he's kind of a wiry kind of guy on the ground. Uh, and when he gets he gets the scramble going, he rushes he, positions. Good. Just defensively, he had some of that Anthony Pettis squirminess where he gets out of situations he probably shouldn't be able to. Yeah. Like not yeah, not at that man. level, but just sure, sure. escapes. That they don't have the, – the escape doesn't have a name, but it worked. Yeah, kind of, yeah, he's yeah. wiry. He's a kind of wiry guy. Uh, he'll he'll lose position looking for submissions. He loves defending takedowns instead of, like, sprawling, pushing the head, elbowing. He, like, reaches over for Kimura. Uh, and, and the the fight on the contender series was a really ugly. Both guys gassed out. It was. Um, I wouldn't have given a contract to him. I, I, I mean, it, it was an entertaining fight. I'll say that because both guys were gassed, but it didn't look pretty. Uh, Fernie, I mean, he's he's a minus athlete. He's flat footed, but he, he tries making up for pressure. Uh, but for some, for, well, I mean, go to the journey. Newsom fight when he lost. He, he didn't let his hands go on that, one, which was surprising. Um, a little gunshot in that, but a lot of times he's, you know, he's he's throwing punches, straight punches down the pipe, kind of, you know, jab, hook combination. Uh, he does like will follow up some wing punches. He loves his check left hook. Uh, not really known for his power, but against Brady Haston, he he was showing some power in that fight. Uh, doesn't check leg kicks. I, I go all the way back to like the Katana series match. Where he got his feet kicked out of him in that. He isn't a wrestler, uh, though he will look for a takedown, but definitely he's not. He's very weak at it. He's a weak defensive wrestler. But he has a submission threat. He's got three subs when the fight hits the ground. Dude, I hate this fight. I, like, I'm not high on either. I, I, don't mean, I don't want to say, like, I hate. Like, listen, I'm two guys. Listen, two homeless guys fighting for a freaking a bottle of Jack Daniels in the parking lot. I'm still going to watch. You know what I mean? So get me wrong when I say I hate this fight. I mean, I'm mean, on a I mean, high level. Like, if, I'm not going to if it's gentleman Jack, I might say I got winner. You know, <laughs> there you go. nice. Um, listen, you don't want to listen. You want to fight some homeless guys? This is not not for alcohol. <laughs> um, I'm just talking like to me, like this is a contender series fight. This might be a LFA fight. But, you know, I'm not high on either guy. Uh, I think Emil has the volume on his side, especially because he's the one with the full camp and. Uh, you know, Fernie's taking it. He's taking a really short notice. Like, like this, from my understanding, like this week or, or, or it's about a week. It, okay, it'll a week. be about a week by the time they hit about the cage. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, but Fernie might be the more polished guy. As crazy as that sounds. Oh. Mm-hmm. Yeah, probably. Um, dude, I'm not high on either. Like, dude, I flip flop to this one. Uh, that's why I think the betting line is off. I ain't going to go with the mail because he's got the full camp. But dude, I get zero confidence. I don't. I don't like the guy. I don't think he's a good prospect at all. Um, I think I'm faded him after that. Give me a meal by split decision with zero confidence. We head up to the 205 pound division for one of the two light heavyweight bouts on the night as Zach Palga takes on Bogdan Guskov. Palga, the 35 year old fighting out of Colorado, is six and two. Overall, he's one and two since joining the UFC as the runner up of season 30 of the Ultimate Fighter. He fought most recently back in June at UFC on ESPN Vittori versus Cannoneer, where he dropped a unanimous decision to Modestus Bukowskis. Uh, he'll look to get back into the win column against Guskov, who will be looking to do the same. 31 year old Uzbekistani is 14 and 3 overall. He's 0 and 1 in the UFC. He stepped in on short notice last September to uh, replace Azamat Mirzakhanov to take on Volkan Uzdemir. That was at UFC Paris. He got choked out late in the first round. Obviously, short notice, kind of saving the, the UFC's biscuits. He gets at least one more shot, and it's going to come against Pauga. Keith, your favorite here is minus 140. Your underdog is plus one ten. Who are they? Oh, jeez! I mean, Pog is the favorite. You are correct. Pog is the favorite, and <laughs> I, I kind of get that because Palga feels as though he might settle in as an okay mid card light heavyweight in uh, the UFC, whereas I don't think Guskov will. Uh, let, me this, be- let me ask you this: 
I, I agree. Like if if you told me one guy's a low level UFC talent or not a UFC talent at all, I would say I, I would agree agree with you, Guskov. But who has a higher upside? If someone if you told me one of them was a top ten guy one day, I guess Guskov just because Pau is thirty five. Yeah, that's but, that, but think, really, yeah. if you tell me either guy. <laughs> Is a top ten guy? I'm going to say, shut up, you liar. <laughs> Neither of these guys is top ten okay. guy. <laughs> I mean, good things about Palga. He competed on the Ultimate Fighter up at to uh, up at uh, heavyweights. He wasn't really well suited to heavyweight, and he, and he bounced back and forth uh, occasionally in his brief uh, regional career. He was lucky that he took on Muhammad Usman, who's kind of an undersized heavyweight himself, but. He physically looks better at 205, but I mean, he beat Jordan Wright and he lost to Modestus Bukowskis. That to me screams just another guy in that division, but uh, you know, he's a decent striker. He's, uh, I mean, he's not a plus athlete for the division. There are some serious plus, a- plus athletes at, at 205. Zach Pauga is not Iwan Kudalaba or you know, John, let alone John Jones, but he's a, he's a decent athlete. Um, he's for a guy who's 35 and only has like six or seven career fights. He doesn't seem quite as raw as you might think. Like I would argue that he might have a more polished skill set than Guskov, even though Guskov has twice as many fights. Uh, like Guskov, I, I don't know what to make of this guy. And I feel bad saying this, but I found myself thinking back in September, was this the best they could do on, on short notice to make sure that Uzdemir got a fight? I, I mean, you look at Guskov, and in some ways, he's kind of a poor man's Uzdemir. Like, he's a stacked, muscular 205-pounder who's not very athletic. And same as Uzdemir, you know, Uzdemir presented as a kickboxer. He had actual kickboxing experience. But in effect, in the cage, he's really just a slugger. Like, Uzdemir has hard kicks, but doesn't use them enough. And he mostly is just a hard hitting brawler in the cage. That's Guskov as well. And he's just all of that at a lower level. And on top of that, it really, really bugs me that he looks like a cross between Anthony Smith and Travis view. Um, <laughs> Travis view is the, the incredible bulk. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, here. Guskov, obviously you look at his record, he's got 12 knockouts. And even if, a lot of those were over really, really low level competition in like Russia and Ukraine and stuff. The dude can clearly crack, but he made Vulcan Uzdemir look like an ace grappler. That is not like that's <laughs> that's <laughs> bad. Uh, yeah, that bad. <laughs> and Palga, who has shown some signs of life on the ground, I think that's a, a possible route to victory for him. Obviously, if Guskov catches Palga clean, he can put him out. But Palga hits hard himself, not as hard shot for shot as Guskov, but I think he's probably more defensively sound. Guskov, for as long as that fight with Uzdemir lasted, I mean, he was overswinging, hands down, just chin way up in the air. Uh, he just looked terrible. And s- some of that, yeah, short notice, throw, you know, the whole kitchen sink at him and, and try to get the thing over with. But that's also how he looked on, on the regional scene. Uh, I, I think this is... A, a matchup kind of between an okay fighter and kind of a poor one barring Guskov really catching Palga on, on the chin in the first two minutes or so. I got Palga on this one. Uh, I, I think he'll be able to keep the distance, even though he's physically shorter. I think he's going to have the reach advantage and he fights longer. I think you'll be able to keep Guskov on the outside. If Guskov comes crashing in, I think Palga can probably just kind of hustle him uh, to the ground in one of those light heavyweight slash heavyweight collision takedowns. And if Palga ends up on top, I think this thing's going to be over quickly. Um, in fact, that's what I've got here. Palga is at least holding his own on the feet. They end up on the ground sometime in the second half of the first round. Palga slaps him around a little bit and gets a top side submission. Give me Palga by first round submission. Yeah, this is a, um, yeah. When I said that this card was a C, yeah. This is this is this is the uh, group project where the the like the really dirty kid like helped you helped out your friends, <laughs> you know. Like I didn't do anything, but uh, um, dude, uh, I'm surprised by Vettel. Like I thought Pago was gonna be a huge favorite. 
I thought it was going to be like a three to one, almost four to one favorite. Uh, I mean, this shows you how much I I, I do with the the bets. Um, Piago, he's he's not a great athlete, and at thirty five, I don't expect him to get better. Uh, but he, you know, he he presses forward with strike in pretty good volume, uh, sets up his shots as well with feints, attacks with combinations. He's got a stiff jab, a nice left hook, falls with some winging overhands, uh, works the body well. A bit of a, like you kind of a hold your ground striker where he's not gonna really back up. He's gonna you know when you come forward he's gonna you know hold his ground and throw down. He's got some plus power. The problem is it's just his lack of speed. You know his hands are slow, uh, but he I mean he's he's a big guy so he can he can hit. Uh, he'll toss out some spinning attacks that I don't like. Um, I, I disagree a little bit on, on his grappling. I don't think he's a good grappler. Um, again, yes, <laughs> compared to Guskov, he, he, he might look like Jordan Burroughs out there, or, or, <laughs> but uh, he's a weak defensive grappler. Uh, but to his credit, he's, he's hard to hold down because he's a big guy, big, strong guy, burly kind of guy. Uh, he can kind of use his size just to kind of power back up. Uh, Guskov, is, is, he's a striker, but, he, but he, even his striking, it's raw, but he throws straight shots down the pipe. Uh, he loves to throw like the same side attack. He'll throw like two crosses in a row, but he can crack, man. I mean, say like again, who's he hitting? I don't know, but when well, he catches a chin, I mean, he's got twelve knockouts on his record. He has some serious defensive issues. He keeps his, you know, chin high in the air. He drops his hands, uh, but he, he he's not a bad athlete. He he's got pretty good like head movement. Uh, though, do Volkanus did hurt him on the feet, uh, and then and he didn't really recover from that, and then. You know his 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 takedown defense was weak and and Usman beat him up the ground. But I saw one fight where he ended up on top, and he's got some vicious ground and pound. Uh, if he's on bottom, I mean his submission defense is a serious serious issue. I think Piago would be really smart just to close the distance, grind in the clinch, wait for his opening, get a trip takedown or something like that. But if I, I say it's pretty equal if they stay on the feet, where I think Piago is 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 more crafty. But what Guskov is, you know, the the guy with the more power. Uh, I said that I thought Piago was going to be this huge favorite, and and I guess yeah, I, mean, I guess he is a favorite, but not to the extent that I expected. I was doing that because I was trying to set it up, man. And sometimes you just got sometimes you just got to go the upside and say fuck it. It would be more fun if if oh, Guskov yeah. lands a shot. So I'm going to go with the dog. I'm going to say Gustav is the better striker. I say he lands more powerful shots. I say, you know, he's got a puncher's chance, and that's really it. Uh, I didn't learn my lesson last week by taking Pete Rodriguez. Uh, you know, it was first don't succeed, try again. Uh, I say he lands a big shot. Give me Gustav my first round knockout. All right. We have our first disagreement of the night on the third fight of the night, and the stakes could not be much lower. Welterweights take the cage next as Max Griffin faces off with Jeremiah Wells. Griffin, the 38-year-old Californian, is 19 and 10 overall. He is 7 and 8 in the UFC. He is coming in to this fight off of a loss, but in fairness to him, uh, he took on undefeated super prospect Michael Morales. That was back last June at the Strickland versus Magomedov uh, fight night and acquitted himself fairly well in a decision loss. Uh, prior to that, he won a split decision over Tim Means. So he's looking to get back in the win column. Uh, so is his opponent, Wells. 37-year-old Pennsylvania native is 12-3-1 overall. He is 4-1 since joining the UFC as the outgoing CFFC welterweight champ. He had been on a six-fight win streak, the last four of them in the UFC, before running into Carlston Harris last August at UFC on ESPN San Hagen versus Font. There, uh, midway through the third round, he got choked all the way to sleep uh, by the man for, they call Mozambique. Uh, nice, beautiful uh, anaconda choke. So uh, he's looking to get back in the win column, restore the honor of Henzo Gracie Philly. He is moderately favored to do so. Wells is minus 180, Griffin plus 150. Keith, again, this is welterweight. So even when Wells won four in a row, he wasn't yeah. remotely near the rankings, but <laughs> he was from one side of Texas to the other, away from yeah. what he was ranking. Uh, but between him and Griffin's kind of remarkable career turnaround in the UFC, these guys have a bit of name value for people this far down a uh, generic fight night card. Uh, tell me who you got in this one and how you see it going. 
you know, just thinking if if welterweight is Texas, is is Rhode Island like female featherweight? Is that what? It is? <laughs> like you're talking about? Like oh man, I take 13 hours to drive all the across Texas. I pretty much drive all of Rhode Island every single day. <laughs> and work. well, it would be the equivalent of like Rhode Island is women's featherweight, and there's like women living in Connecticut and, and you're like, that's Bantamweight. And you're like, you can have a free house if you move down here. And they're yeah. like, no, 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 but we'll, we'll stay <laughs> up here. <laughs> yeah. Like I, I don't, I don't drive the entire state, but uh, the city I work in is in the very North of the, of the state. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, it's above Providence or it touches Massachusetts. Like it's, it touches Providence and then it touches Massachusetts. Um, I'm not in the the very south. Uh, so the my town I live in is the biggest town in New England, per okay. per size. Okay, it actually does go all the way to the south, but I don't live in like the south part of the of my town. I live in the northern part. So, but <laughs> I'm about twenty minutes away from the to Connecticut border. So, or, or give or take, <laughs> give or take. So I'm about twenty minutes away from driving the entire state. So, um. Yeah, it's I, I'm enjoying talking about geography more than some of these. That said, this is not the fight. Like, no, nope. it's like the diss again. It's one of those you could make an argument. This could be the co-main event. It's sure. not, you know, at least at least on the main card. Like to be this far behind down, I'm, I'm very surprised by it. Um, if Jeremiah Wells wins, he's five and one in the UFC. What's he doing below Michael Johnson and Armin Petrosian on this card? Yeah, I don't know. Like, I don't know. I, I don't know. I, I mean, yeah, he's he's coming off a loss, so it's, so it, it, yeah. take it for what it's worth. And and but the thing is, he's also he's taking on a very tough guy. And like this is that's what I'm saying. It's good. Like yeah. Max Kerman, yeah, he didn't have the greatest record, but he's he's got a good record in the UFC, and he's mm-hmm. in that division. And he's he's a well-rounded fighter who who appears to somehow be getting better at age 38. Now, again, that wasn't and the case. I'll interject here. There's a reason why, and there's a reason why it almost feels like a tale of two careers. Like he started like two and five and he's like five and two since then or something. Remember that he had like a uh, diabetes or something that was not well under control and his weight cuts were miserable and shit. And once he got that fixed, he really did turn okay, things yeah. around. Unfortunately, he was already like 35 at that point and now yeah, he's 38. Yeah. But yeah, that's why he's so much better the last couple of years. Yeah, the like key showed against like he has limited ability when he goes against someone like Michael Morales. But so it's ninety nine percent of welterweights, <laughs> you know. Yeah, I mean, uh, no one's beaten him yet. <laughs> I, I don't think it was a terrible showing from Max Griffin. Uh, he he's a pressure striker who's technically sound. He's got he's got fast hands. Uh, everything is is coming in tight tight down the pipe. Good jab. Uh, I love his short right. Very accurate. Not a lot of tells. Uh, fights behind a high guard. He's got good power. Uh, and he's a smart, intelligent guy. Very similar to like we're going to talk about Hermanson, where he's not the most skilled guy, not like really, you know, jumps off the page. Oh, he does this so well. I mean, that's what Jeremiah Wells, Jeremiah Wells is. <laughs> you know, that's not Max Griffin, but Max Griffin's going to put himself in in the best position to win. Uh, he's a good wrestler, uh, much better than he when he first showed up in the UFC. Pretty underrated in that category. Good at winning scrambles. Strong top game. You went with Jeremiah Wells. Uh, you know, he's a short, stocky guy for the weight class. But he's had these, I always said this, he's short, but he has these deceivingly long arms. He, he likes to switch stances, and he likes to come out like guns blazing. He's a very aggressive, fast starter like he was against Wiley Adams and Court McGee. He's fast. He's explosive. Really whips his punches in such force. I was there when he broke Gary Belletta's jaw with a punch. I mean, I mean you could hear it in the, in the crowd. Uh, he closes this in super, super quick. Uh, though he can overthrow his shots. Uh, he loves spinning attacks, flying knees. Uh, we saw against uh, Matthew Semmelsberger and Blood Diamond that he, you know, if the guy's a very dangerous striker, even though he's a dynamic guy, he's smart enough to go, why play that game? I can still wrestle. I have a huge wrestling advantage. He mixes his striking and takedowns together well. He understands, like, the risk, and, and sometimes he will play it safe. Uh, I am I am slightly worried about his chin uh, as he was dropped in by the Semmelsberger you know, someone's worth three times in that fight. Um, that was because he was, I think he was really trying to, he that the one time he, at times he wasn't trying to play it safe and he was really squaring up. Like that's one that he can do and I really square up and kind of Chris Lieb in it, kind of, you know, like hold your ground and, and, and wing. Uh, and then you obviously look concerned um, getting caught with the submission in his, in his last match. This is a great fight. 
I think both guys are really good. Uh, I think overlooked guys in the division. Griffin is the more polished fighter, but Wells is 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 more spectacular. I have flip flopped on this one. Um, man, I, I'm flip flopping as I'm picking now. I, I, I mean, the, if, if someone gets a stop, it just Wells. You know, Wells comes out of the gate, blasts them. Okay. And and I, my brain is saying to take Wells. <laughs> you know, like this is an easy pick for Wells. He's, he's, he's more dynamic than Griffin everywhere. But then, like another part of my brain is saying, like, dude. Griffin is crafty. Like, he's this guy. Like, if he can weather the storm, he'll make adjustments. And he'll start take over with pressure. You know? Um, Griffin's not a guy that will, will, you know, when it gets tough, will cower. And, and, and You know? I'm going to say Griffin somehow finds a way to get it done. Like, he's, he weathers the storm, takes over, wins like a close second, close third round. And give me Griffin by split decision. You took the words right out of my mouth there. We have our first unanimous upset pick of the evening because I agree. And there's every possibility that we're going to look really silly when Wells flatlines this man in 90 seconds. But if he doesn't, the longer the fight goes on, uh, I, I like Griffin better and better. He's gone from an undurable guy who faded late against, you know, Alex Morono, Alex Oliveira, to a guy that, it, uh, yeah, he he lost to Michael Morales. I think he lost all three rounds to Morales. But you know what? Sure. He took 15 minutes of artillery from a vicious knockout artist and That's a good point. avoided the worst of it. Uh, you know, like Wells, in comparison, is more like a cannon that you know is going to be like trained on you and fired three or four times a round, whereas Morales is more like this storm of kicks and, and, and stuff. Like, and he acquitted himself all right in that. Like he lost to one of the best prospects in the division, but before that back-to-back fights against Tim means and Neil Magny, just two grindy, durable, uh, just nullifier type fighters. And he was right there with both of them. And I could see him putting on one of those type performances against Wells. Uh, I fully expect him to be in trouble at some point during this fight, but even at 38, I, again, thanks to addressing his health issues, he's, he seems more durable at 38 than he was at 33. Uh, I'm not going to be comfortable or relaxed with this pick until that final horn sounds, but I'm with you. Give me Griffin to, to eke out two rounds out of three, avoid the real big bombs coming his way from Wells. It helps his cause. If Wells is just a little bit cautious and, and trigger shy, because you know what? If Wells has any PTSD from that Anaconda choke, you know, Griffin has a good front headlock series. He's not going to want to just come crashing in heedlessly. Uh, but yeah, give me Griffin to win a nail biter here as well. Uh, unanimous upset pick. Yeah. It's, uh, and it's the thing I'll say about that. We both have been high in Wells. So it's not really a distant Wells. It's more no. of a thing on Griffin. Like we've been, we've been back as a Wells. Oh, I, I mean, if, if this thing is over in a minute and 10 seconds on the recap, we're going to, Gonna both be like, well, we forgot about the right hand, didn't we? Yeah, you know. <laughs> and, and I hate picking against Daniel Gracie guys. Like I, I, like, we all have the certain teams that we really like. Daniel Gracie's a great team. Is is that's my team. I love that team. They're they're a fantastic team, and he stands out from them because he doesn't fight like the rest of those guys. Like yeah. Sean Brady is much more yeah. Yeah. of a, an indicator of what the rest of that team is like. But but he can at times though. Mm-hmm. You just you you remember the big explosive knockout. Yeah, but he has times where no. he'll go for takedowns, no. hold top position, grind. He is he is what Phil Hawes would have been if Phil Hawes was good, <laughs> like wrestling enough, you know. <laughs> <laughs> like, I, just, I just imagine Phil Hawes somewhere listening to this, going like, "Really, guys? What the hell do I do?" <laughs> He's not even listening. He's like, "Oh man, it's like I just got a nosebleed." But <laughs> <laughs> poor, poor, poor Phil. Phil. I, I love Phil. Like, dude, I love wrestlers. I, I hate this non wrestlers, but the the piece is never quite came together for him in the way they should have with his raw skills. And Wells is more, I think of what, yeah, he's willing to wrestle when it's the smart move and his willingness to do that only opens people up for the crushing power even more. Yeah. Yeah. This is good. This is a good fight. I actually, I think this should be the coming of it now. You convinced me. Yep. <laughs> I didn't even say anything, but I agree <laughs> with you. <laughs> We head back to the 205-pound division for a clash between Devin Clark and Martin Procneo. 
Clark, the 33-year-old South Dakota native, is 14-8 and eight overall. He is 8-8 eight and eight in the UFC. He is coming into this fight off a loss. In fact, he has alternated wins and losses for his last five fights. But uh, he took on Kennedy Zechikwu at UFC 288 last May. He got choked all the way to sleep uh, midway through the second round. So uh, he, like just about everybody on this card so far, is looking to get back in the win column. He will look to do it against Procneo. Uh, Procneo, 35-year-old pole, is 16-7 and seven overall. He is 3-5 and five in the UFC. He is, of course, coming in off a loss. He fought at UFC 290 last July, got choked out by Vitor Petrino in the third round. Odds here, not terribly close. This is one of those few fights on the card that is wide or wider than than two to one. Best odds I could find are Clark minus 200, Procneo plus 170. <laughs> that sums up that sums up both these guys we just go <sighs> i mean 205 is not a great division and even by those standards procneo is is rough uh, aside from people that have been signed off the contender series in the last year and might be like oh and one or oh and two and some or something he probably is the worst long time light heavyweight on the roster like when you are losing to like Sam Alvey and, and slow Mike Rodriguez, like he, he, he went 0 and 3 to start his UFC run, losing to Sam Alvey, Magomed and Kalayev. That's, uh, that's understandable. And Mike Rodriguez, all three of them by first round knockout. Like, how did this dude even stick around? Uh, his win over Khalil Roundtree is one of the greatest aberrations in the, yeah, the history of that division. Hell? Yeah, what the but, hell? But ultimately, he, and he, I, he just he just isn't good uh he's big he's a he's a good size light heavyweight but he is slow 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 it's ironically considering he i mean he, i just talked about slow mike rodriguez i mean procneo got beat to the punch by sam alvey and and mike rodriguez he might i believe he's rodriguez's only ufc win i'm pretty sure he is sam alvey's last finish in the ufc and in both cases he sets up and presents like a karate flavored kickboxer and he's just slow and he's slow enough that even though he's not that unsound fundamentally, people are just beating him to the punch. It's it's I remember saying this about Ed Herman, like Ed Herman's last fight when he took on uh, Zach Cummings. And I'm like, Herman had his hands in the exact right place. His chin was tucked. His hands were up and he was so slow that Cummings was just putting punches right between his guard and hitting him in the face because he couldn't react fast enough. That's Marcin Pracnio. And that was Marcin Pracnio like five years ago. He's not gotten better since then. Uh, <laughs> You're going hard on Pracnio right now. <laughs> I'm just, I, I'm, I'm kind of marveling that he's still in the UFC. I, that, I mean, that, I, like, I'm not trying to diss him. I'm just like, he's 35. He was not UFC material at 30. And he's not especially gotten better. I mean, at least they like fed him to people that are trying to put over like Felipe Linz two years ago, Vitor Petrino last year. But here, I think Clark wipes him. And and Clark, I, I, Clark's a fun fighter. And he's a guy that has fought beyond his, his limits to, to do pretty well sometimes. But he is a limited fighter. Like when he's fought the, the best of the best, they, they've generally wiped him pretty hard. Um, yeah. He's... An undersized light heavyweight. Well, I say undersized. He's short, short. and kind of squat. Yeah, yeah he's, yeah, he's short and squat. I mean, he's a broad dude. I yeah. mean, he, he looks. He's, he he's looks, like Loma. He's like Loma. Yeah, like, like I mean, like, he looks. Like, you know what I mean? Like she's, she's more yeah. um, <laughs> what am I, horizontal than vertical. Yeah, like Loma. Loma weighs more probably than than some straw weights, but she's the shortest. Yeah. Uh, I mean, he's looked small next to William Knight and Alonzo Menafield, but yeah, he, he's a big burly guy. Uh, he's not a great striker. I, I think his striking's a, a little ugly. Needs to throw in combination more. He's defensively open uh, and just bigger, faster, rangier guys uh, have tended to be able to hit him at will and good grapplers have really been able to take advantage of him. Uh on the ground he's gotten you know guillotined by two of the taller fighters he's taken on 
uh, Anthony Smith just completely ran over him on the ground. Like, you know, I think he was even favored over Smith in that fight because Smith was on such a rough streak at the time, and Smith just made him look amateurish on the ground. Uh, you know, just triangled him, swept top, and and the thing was over in like two minutes. Uh, so Devin Clark is limited, but I bet he's going to keep alternating wins and losses for you know probably three or four more years here. Whereas I, I think Procneo might be gone after this one. Uh, given that Procneo is not durable, I'm going to say that Clark actually gets a TKO here, probably just through accumulated wear, probably finishes it on the ground. So give me Clark by third round TKO. But yeah, I expect him to get the better of most of the exchanges here. Yeah, um, I mean, Clark, you know, these guys, these two guys have been in the UFC a long time. Um, Clark on the feet, I mean, he's a pocket boxer, uh, but he's the problem is he's he's very hittable. Uh, I am a little worried about his durability because he's taken so much damage over the years. Uh, I go back to like Asmat Merzikhanov was hurting him. Uh, Kennedy and Chuko was battering him in, in their fight. He, I mean, you mentioned about you know, being a wide guy, he's got pop. So he's, he's very physically strong. I mean, he uses that strength, uh, you know, to land power shots. He gets, he can start someone. What else uses that strength where he battles in the clinch. He likes to plumb clinch. He's solid there. He likes to battle with knees. I mean, he did really good against Alonzo Metafield. Uh, though Kenny and Chuko beat him up bad in a clinch with position that you know, he likes. He can wrestle. Um, I do think his wrestling is a little overrated, but he, I mean, he wrestled Dung on June recently. He likes like a reactionary double, kind of backs up and then shoots when his opponent overthrows. Uh, good at turning the corner, good hip control. But he's he's he is an issue when it hits the ground. He's been submitted four times. A lot of that's been like when he's gassed out. I have no clue about his cardio. I mean, one fight cardio is his strength. Next fight cardio, he, he looks like he hit the ball very early. So, uh, like that's one of the big mysteries to me. Darren Clark's cardio. Uh, Pracnio, he's got this like Taekwondo style striking. He throws shots with his hands hanging low. You mentioned it, not very fast, not very powerful, not not even good volume. He's a bit of a point striker. Um, even fights where he's had advantages in the striking, and if, like you said, they're not often, but like against like William Knight, he played it safe, never really fought for a stoppage, just kind of sticking to move in, they wouldn't take the chance. Um, I would say the one thing about his striking that's good is probably his kicks. He's got a good kicking game. I mean, he stopped Ike Villanueva with a body shot. Uh, got some hard calf kicks. He he will wrestle a little bit. He uses his size in the clinch, but he's a weak defensive wrestler. I mean, he got out-wrestled by Felipe Lenz bad. Struggled to get off the bottom, off his back. Um, not the greatest chin. You mentioned it, like Sam Alvey. Uh, crushed him like Rodriguez crushed him. I mean, like, yeah, Magma and Clive, yeah, we'll give you a pass on that, but like like older Sam Alvey. No, I, I'm not high on either one, but I'm with you. Like, I, I, I'm not surprised that Clark is such a big favorite. He He's the better wrestler. He should be the better one to clinch. He might even be the better striker. Uh, I'm, I'm fading Clark moving forward. He's not a guy I'm probably picking often moving forward, but this is the kind of guy that he should be. If he loses to Brock now, Clark is completely shot. Yeah, I I think there's a case that he is shot. That still might be enough to beat Brock Neo. Uh, give me Clark to kind of have an advantage everywhere. Give me Clark. Yeah, I'm with you. I think Clark might might stop him, might, maybe with a takedown, beat him up a little bit on the ground, might maybe land some shots in the pocket. Uh, I'll, you know what? No, Clark doesn't. He's not a big finisher. I go, I'll go Clark by decision. Next up at UFC Vegas 86 is the lone women's fight on the card as Konklak Loma Labumi Supisara takes on Bruna Brazil. Loma, 28-year-old Thai, is 8-3 and three overall. She is 5-2 and two since joining the UFC out of Invicta. She fought most recently almost a year ago. It was uh, all the way back last February at UFC 284 where she uh, tapped out Elise Reed. Uh, flexing some uh, some ground game uh, early in the second round. Prior to that, she had a unanimous decision win over uh, Denise Gomez. So she will be trying to make it three in a row, uh, turn herself perhaps from an entertaining character into a rising contender at the expense of Brazil. 30-year-old from, well, 
Brazil is nine, three and one overall. She is one and one since joining the UFC out of season six of Dana White's contender series. Uh, she fought last July at uh, the UFC London card, taking a unanimous decision over Shauna Bannon, yet another example of a foreign fighter taken out an English or Irish fighter at UFC London. It was a uh, rough matchmaking for the, for the home crowd there. Prior to that, she got knocked out by uh, Gomez in the second round in her UFC debut back in April. Odds here, Loma is the second biggest favorite on the card. She is minus 250, Brazil plus 200. Uh, Keith, I, I get why the line is what it is. Uh, Bruna Brazil came to the UFC with a certain amount of hype. That they were talking about her her kickboxing credentials. And I don't want to speak from a place of ignorance and dismiss those. Like, <laughs> just do it. But, <laughs> well, she, they said, you know, she's champ of, of this, na Brazilian national champ of that organization. But we're not talking about top, top level organizations here. Like, kickboxing is so loosely regulated compared to MMA. It's kind of yeah. like an LFA champ calling themselves, calling themselves a world champ. Yeah. Everybody's a world or champ. The, 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 the case, the, the example you always say, you know, yeah, you were a Texas state champ. Was at the three, a four, a or five, a yeah. level. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, so Brazil, <laughs> we can say comes from a kickboxing background. Uh, she is tall, rangy. I mean, she's got, I mean, she's not quite, Marina Rodriguez, tall and rangy, but she's that same basic body type. And when she's faced with a completely overmatched opponent, she looks like a fantastic striker. I mean, but the problem is on the contender series, she took on Marnik Mann, who is one of the worst fighters to show up in the contender series in the last couple seasons and happens to be maybe the shortest one ever. So yeah, of course she had kicked her. And then she took on Shauna Bannon in her last appearance. Bannon a boxer and not uh, just not a great prospect. You know, she had some shine because she's Irish and brash and apparently fell asleep at the tanning salon, uh, you know, under one of the beds, but in between she couldn't maintain distance against the Gomez. Just Gomez was too strong, too burly, too aggressive. Uh, and she was never comfortable and she got pounded out. That's a bad style matchup against Loma. Loma has, she's done better than I expected. When, when I knew she was coming to the UFC, I thought, well, she'll be a lot of fun for as long as it lasts, but she'll probably win one, lose one, win one, lose one. She'll be just like hilarious and charming in interviews and we'll get some killer highlights out of it, but she won't actually turn into a well-rounded mixed martial artist or anything, but she's gotten better and better. Uh, She's still not beating the absolute best of the best, but the Denise Gomez win was a good win. And her losses in the UFC, a loss to Angela Hill that was kind of mystifying. She didn't show great fight IQ in that fight. And I think if they ran that one back a year later, let alone now, I think she'd handle Hill easily. And I say that as a, definitely the, the Angela Hill booster of the two of us. And then Lupe Godinez, who is, uh, you know, a, a rising, probably on her way to the top 10 type fighter. like. Aside from that, she's been able to make her Muay Thai work, you know, even against women who are almost all taller and rangier than she is. Here, she's not going to be able to threaten with takedowns like Loopy. She's not going to, uh, Loma's not going to stumble into this like weird funk like she did against Hill and just kind of hang out at the wrong range and, and lose two out of three rounds. I think Bruno Brazil's kind of made to order for. Uh, Loma fights well at range despite being short. And I don't think she'll have any problem closing the distance on, if she needs to on Brazil. Brazil is somebody that, while she is a Muay Thai striker, if like she doesn't like what she's getting on the feet or if she's having trouble walking her opponent down, she does like to initiate the clinch. That's not going to be a safe place for her against Loma. I just, I think Loma just batters her. I, I think I'm not going to call for a finish here though. I mean, if she could take Elisa's read, Elise reads back in a flash and choke her out, she could certainly do the same to Brazil. Who's not even close to as good on the ground as Reed is, but 
I'm going to say she probably wins all three rounds and Brazil just looks battered and frustrated at the end of it. I think she chops up her legs. I think she marks up her face. Uh, I think we see a lot of knees to the ribs and Brazil just has a miserable night of it. Yeah. Um, I mean, Loma's our girl. Like she's one of our favorites. Like we need to just have a category of just people. We just put in our favorite box and she, she's, she's the doorkeeper, <laughs> you know? Um, yeah. She, she is. She's such a good striker. Well, I mean, we just need a wooden cutout of her in front of our, our house of favorite fighters that says, you must be this tall to enter. <laughs> there you go. I gotta be the tall of the Lomo to get in. Yeah. Uh, I mean, she's, she's a, she's a Muay Thai striker with quick hands, good pop. Uh, you know, when you look at it, you don't expect that, but she, she can crack incredible kicking game though. I mean, maybe the hardest leg kicker in, in women's MMA. Like I, I really truly believe that. Like I would not want to get kicked well, by her. Well, pound for pound. I I'm completely with you. It might be, it might be regardless. And, and, it might be regardless. And, and you're, you're right. It's deceptive because she's not built like Jinyu Fry or Ariane Carnalosi. Like, no. if you didn't know better, you'd be like, I mean, she looks like a five foot tall woman in in decent shape. She doesn't look like a world class athlete, but she fights like one. No, no. Yeah. She, 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 she looks like she, a girl that ha, like a girl that was a really good athlete in high school, and then had like that, like that freshman fifteen put on her. Yeah. You know, with the first year of college, you know, the late night pizza and stuff. But um, there you go. Still like it. Like, yeah, I still get down. <laughs> but, you know, <laughs> but, uh, I'm not saying that. Listen, I'm talking with a girl in college. I'm not I'm not yeah. trying to be inappropriate with with a, a professional fighter. Yeah. Uh, she's. She's I mean, like I said, like her kicking game is so good. I, we talk about the hard leg kicks, man. Her teep kicks up the middle are just deadly. Uh, despite her lack of size, she's good. You mentioned she's good at glitch. I mean, she beat the shit out of Chinua Fry inside the clinch. So good at framing, landing small shots in the, in the small spaces, you know, knees, elbows, everything. And, you know, the knock on her, and knock on any, like, really Muay Thai, you know, traditional Muay Thai. Like, like, they say Muay Thai a lot, but this is, like, the traditional, you know, thailand style. Muay Thai striker, yeah, literal Thai boxing, yeah. or Thai boxing, yeah, not big yeah. boxing, what they call Muay Thai, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. Uh, the the knockout has always been obviously taking on the fence, but she's improved her her wrestling greatly in her in her run UFC. I mean, she got four takedowns against Sam Hughes and, and Denise Gomez. She got mm-hmm. takedowns in her last fight. Uh, she did get takedown by Lupi Godinez four times, but I mean, Lupi Godinez is a crazy good wrestler. She, so, she's one of the three best wrestlers in that division. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and, and even when she's taken down, despite her size, she's finding ways to get back up. I mean, she got a submission in the last win. So uh, she's come a really long way. Bruno Brazil, yeah, I, I'm with you. Like, I believe everybody who's done kickboxing has a has a world championship. Like, what, what does that mean? So uh, she's a good athlete. She's explosive. I mean, she's a, she want, you know, she's a kickboxer. She sets up her shots and feints well. Uh, but she keeps her hands really low and wide, which which I hate. She keeps her chin very high, and and she lacks head movement. I Denise Gomez uh, was hurting her on the feet with it seemed like every strike. She can't she can't block a right hook because she keeps her hands so low. Uh, it was like two fights in a row. It's like uh, I do like her kicking game. I mean, she landed a beautiful high kick knock on the contender series. She's she's explosive and fast enough. But like she's one of the people that does spinning attacks. I don't mind. She will look to wrestle, gets to the clinch, gets some throws and stuff, but she's a weak defensive wrestler. To her credit, she did get a sweep on the contender series, and she has two submission wins. Uh, I'm with you, man. I, I like Loma big. I just She continues to improve each fight. Brazil is, is a well you know, well-rounded uh, offensively, but her lack of defense makes me super confident in Loma. I say Loma, Loma puts on a clinic on the feet. I think she hurts her with the body shots. I think he, she finishes off with some ground and pound. Give, give me Loma by second round TKO. Second from the top of the UFC Vegas 86 prelims is a matchup between Demir Hadjevic and Balaji Oki. Hadjevic, the 37-year-old Bosnian, is 14-7 and seven overall. He is 4-5 and five in the UFC. He has lost three of his last four, and he is coming in off a loss. Uh, he dropped a unanimous decision to Mark Jacquesi at UFC London last July. Uh, so his job potentially on the line here, uh, but definitely looking to regain any kind of momentum. He will look to do it against uh, Oki. Uh, 28-year-old uh, South African fighting out of Belgium is 8-1. and one. 
overall. And after losing his professional debut, he has won eight straight since then. So uh, he's very much on that Jack Della Maddalena type tip where he is effectively undefeated. Uh, he fought on the Contender Series last August, crushing Dylan Salvador with a body punch uh, in the first round. To uh, He was certainly the class of that episode of the Contender Series. No brainer to be signed to the UFC. And uh, here he makes his debut. He is the biggest favorite on the card. He comes in around minus 275, minus 280. Hadjevic out there at plus 225 or so. Uh, Keith, if I, I'm sure when people listen to the hype and sizzle reels during fight week this week, they'll hear Oki being built up. Uh, certainly the, the hype machine started cranking away as soon as he uh, wrecked that dude on the contender series. Yeah. Uh, do you see, uh, I, you know, at 155, I won't say, do you see top 10 upside? Yeah. No. The answer is almost always no, but uh, like, to what extent are you a believer in him? And is Hadjovic the perfect kind of opponent for him to make a big splash? Yeah, absolutely. Stadium. Yeah, because Hatsvik is a perfect opponent. I mean, uh, like, Hatsvik is, is tailor-made for this guy. Like, that said, there's, you know, still question marks about his, particularly his ground game, so there's things that Hatsvik could take advantage of. Um, but Hatsvik, I mean, I mean, on the feet, he's going to give him what he wants. Hatsvik's going to throw it out. I mean, he's a high-volume striker. He constantly moving forward and taking ground. I, I'd say Hatsvik's a decent boxer, tight strikes down the pipe. He loves closing distance on loading power shots. Uh, I actually like his wraparound right hand. I, I like his step in knees. Well, his defense, he's fights behind that high guard. The problem is he's, you know, kind of this traditional kickboxer where he backs straight up on the center line. He will occasionally try to wrestle offensively, though he's not good at it. And he is one of the weakest defense wrestlers I've seen in the UFC recently. Um, I mean, sure, sure, some of that is is a little. Uh, Thwarted by going against Mark Casey, who turned him into a, a takedown dummy. And we already mentioned this on the show. Casey's a strong wrestler. I mean, yeah. Casey wants to be the black English version of Bo Nickel. <laughs> like, um, ding, ding, ding. But uh, to credit, credit has been, he, he does work back to his feet, but he's, you know, gets a guy like Moicano, Moicano something really quick. And even like it, the best moments in his career, he like he gassed against. In, in a win against Yancey Medeiros. Uh, Oki, you know, I haven't seen too much of his ground, but on the feet, he looks dynamic. I mean, he's a distant striker who really wants to counter-strike very fast hands. He attacks with combinations. Chris Jab, killer left hook. Um, seen a lot. I mean, it, it, it's hard to really get a grasp of this guy because, I mean – you know, you know, some film study, and like I said, I was I was standing <laughs> sitting in the stands uh, a lot this week. I mean, I was at a, last weekend. I was at a, a, a out of state tournament for my son, and then I was at a uh, you know the the middle school states this week. So, you know, I was really trying to focus on my, on my boys. But you know, I'll say this: when I'm sitting in the stands watching this dude, dude, he's he, he's he, dude, he's fun to watch. <laughs> like, and um, you know. Knockout, knockout, live a shot, knockout. It's like he, he it, you know, I, I watched a lot of highlights of this guy, and the highlights are freaking dynamic. So, uh, serious power, great, great high kick. If Hazard is smart, he's going to close the distance immediately and try to wrestle. But, like, Hazard is not a great wrestler to begin with. Like, it's not like, it's not something, that, you know, can, it, it's like, Yoki has nothing on the ground, sure. And, and there was one fight that I didn't get to watch uh, just for a time where he went like a decision. And I really wanted to watch that to see what we kind of had, but like the times I've seen him on the ground, he's been pretty good with the ground and pound. So I don't think Hasbro's going to be able to get him down. I think I was, and him are going to battle it on the feet. And I think I was going to make him pay. I think he's going to crush him with a body shot. I think he's going to knock him off. I think the hype is going to saw through the roof and he's going to win by first round TKO. Yeah. Not much to add oh. to that. I kind of threw out that baiting question. It how is Hadjovic as a, a setup of opponent to put Oki over? Because I thought the same thing. This is perfect because one, he's not a good wrestler. He is a, a striker himself. So he, he's going to oblige Oki with the kind of fight he needs Two, he's not durable. Well, he wasn't durable the last time we saw him when he was 35. Now he's 37 and has, and has had some, some injury layoffs. So it's not even a case of, well, if Oki nukes him in the first four minutes, great. If not, 
it favors Hazovich as it goes along. I don't think it does. I, I think if, if, if it's a fairly evenly matched kickboxing match early on, which I don't think it will be, but even if it were, Hazovich is the guy that's probably going to wear out first. And yeah, seeing, I, I think this is one more for, uh, for Oki's highlight reel. I don't know what his upside, his like ultimate top upside is in, in the UFC. Like it, it, even if he knocks out his next three opponents in the first round, it's always the, well, what's it look like when he gets a little further up and meets determined wrestlers who are durable enough to take some shots from him. The same thing you ask about any hot shit striker, but we're not going to find that out on Saturday. On Saturday, he is going to nuke Demir Hadzovic. Uh, I'm with you. I would not be surprised at all if it starts with a body shot. It's going to be there for him. But, you know, if he if he goes headhunting, those kicks he has to all levels are just nasty. Uh, I I don't think this gets out of the first round either. Uh, give me Oki by first round KO. The top prelim at UFC Fight Night 236 is a welterweight matchup between Trevin Giles and Carlos Prates. Giles, the 31-year-old Houstonian, is 16-5 and five overall. He's 7-5 and five in the UFC. He is 2-2 two and two since moving down from middleweight to welterweight. Uh, since moving down to welterweight in the wake of a KO loss to now champ uh, Drickus Duplessis, he has uh, losses to Michael Morales and Gabriel Bonfim, uh, sandwiched around wins over Lewis Cosey and Preston Parsons. He uh, fought most recently in July at UFC 291, uh, getting guillotined in like a minute by Bonfim. He's going to look to bounce back from that here against uh, Prates. 30-year-old Brazilian, 17-6 and six overall. This will be his debut. He uh, competed on the Contender Series last season in August. In fact, it was the exact same episode as Balaji Oki, whom we just finished talking about. Uh, he knocked out Mitch Ramirez in the second round to punch his ticket to the big octagon. Prates is a big favorite here. He is minus 200, Giles plus 170. Uh, I have, and again, here I will make the, you know, I, I will make the uh, disclaimer that, you know, I make my my hometown boosterism uh, a matter of public record, but even within the bounds of Houston, there are the fighters that are Houston guys, and then there are the fighters that are like actual acquaintances of mine. I wouldn't say Trevin Giles is like a friend of mine, but his coach Jeremy Mayen absolutely is. So take my assessment here. You know, it's it's because when he was it's because when he was a police officer at that time he arrested you that you you're not friends with him anymore, right? You like, <laughs> get your break. We just don't make eye contact. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <clears throat> but I, I will say this: Trevin Giles has the skills and physical gifts to be a top 50 in multiweight. Like he is a well-rounded offensive fighter. He's a good boxer with good kicks. Uh, he is a surprisingly good offensive wrestler. He is more than capable of taking care of himself on the ground in terms of submission grappling. Uh, his problem has always been inconsistency and lack of focus. And it's not even, it's not even durability really, or, or cardio. It's not like, well, if Giles doesn't finish it in the first seven minutes, he's, he's toast it's and i compared him i i think uh in one of our previous previews to the death star just giles is gonna make a couple of isolated mistakes every fight if his opponent is good enough and has the presence of mind to take advantage giles is probably gonna lose that fight if he doesn't giles is probably gonna win unless the guy is just an off the charts better fighter and you can see that even in his losses he was winning. Like he was beating Gerald Mearshart until he got guillotined. He won the first round against Drickus Duplessis, who again is your champ now, got lamped in the second round. Uh, Michael Morales may just be a better fighter than Trevin Giles. Like for all we know, Morales is a future champ in that division. But Gabriel Bonfim, you know, Giles made one mistake, got guillotined. Uh, so the question to me is is Carlos Prates the uh, kind of fighter that's going to be able to take advantage of it? Because what I see in Prates is he's a big, strong, fast kickboxer with good power. Um, throws, you know, a variety of strikes to all uh, levels. Nice leg kicks, nasty kicks to the body, good power in both hands. But that's the kind of thing that Giles can handle. But there's going to be moments where just, again, it's like the Death Star just presents that little exhaust port. And if you can get your torpedo in there, Trevor Giles is going to blow up. I mean, I'm slightly leaning 
Prates here, but he has never fought anybody even remotely the quality of Trevin Giles. Like it's going to be that merging into freeway traffic on a bicycle thing. Like Giles is just going to be bigger, faster, stronger, more skilled than everybody Prates has fought so far. Uh, so we're going to learn a lot about the guy. I'm leaning Prates here. And if I'm leaning Prates, I might as well not go decision because I know how it's going to end. It's going to look great until Giles like makes that mistake and gets blown up. So I'm going to say Prates wins by third round uh, knockout in a fight that he is losing up until that point. And we learned a little bit about him, his ability maybe to make adjustments between rounds, survive ad- adversity. But uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Carlos Prates survives, advances, the the hype train uh, cranks on. Would love to be wrong on this one, but uh, I, you know, I've seen a lot of Trevor Giles fights. What if uh, Prates is like getting pieced up and all of a sudden just hears Obi-Wan's voice, use the force, Carlos. <laughs> he, he just closes like his little, eyes. A little targeting computer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he just closes his eyes and just lets his hands go. <laughs> oh, you know, yeah. kick, high kick to the face or something. Um. Yeah, Trevor Giles. I agree with a lot of things you said. It's like he just something about him. They just he cannot get it all together. Um, similar to like a Michael Johnson who's later on in this card. He's a big, big welterweight. You know, former middleweight, technically sound boxer that wants to work from distance. He moves well. He's got good footwork, but he hates being pressured. You know, he wants to keep that distance. I mean. Bonfim ran right through him with his pressure. Uh, I mean, even like Preston Parsons had a lot of success just pressure him. Uh, when he lets his hands go, he got fast hands, but he's a bit of a JV version of Sean Strickland. And what I mean by that is everything comes off his jab. It's a, a bit of like a Floyd Mayweather up jab. Uh, you know, his best success would probably be Bevin Lewis when he dropped him with a jab. But like Sean Strickland, he, he's a bit of a point striker. Never really takes out a second gear. Came really close again, very Strickland style. His output can be low at times, like Strickland was against uh, late in the fight against uh, Drakus Duplessy. So he's, a, like I said, he's a JV version of, of Sean Strickland. Like when Strickland, I mean, I don't want to go down Strickland's ramp, but you, you, I think you get the comparisons. Yeah. Uh, He's not bad when he closes the distance and, and kind of grinds in the clinch and uses his size and that. He will wrestle a little bit. Uh, his his striking does, you know, he does use his striking pretty well to set up his entries, though he doesn't wrestle enough. I think it's something that he should do. Just I mean, just to help win fights and win rounds. Well, look how easily he beat Lewis Kosi because he decided to wrestle him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree. I, agree. I mean, yeah. uh, if he's taken down himself, he's hard to hold down because of how big he is. So kind of something we were talking about. Uh, Zach Poirier just kind of, you know, he's so strong. Like, that's something you can't deny of uh, Trevin Giles. Though, to his credit, like, when it hits the ground, uh, um, or should I say to his judgment, he's been subbed a few times in the past. Uh, he's also gassed out in the past, which is an issue. And then I'm, and then you mentioned over and over again, you know, his, the biggest issue is his durability. He's, he's been knocked out a lot and a lot lately. So, uh, Pratis, you know, the, the Jedi. Carlos, Carlos, the Skywalker, Prater. So he's he's a kickboxer that can fight a both stance, long distance striker. Um, yeah, he's he's knocked out lower level competition, but it's the way he's doing, man. The guy's a bit of a sniper. You know, he hangs his hands low, but I like how relaxed he is. Doesn't rush anything. Uh, I love his jab, very accurate, straight left. It, which is why you know he just he fights out of both stances. I like him better than the southpaw stance. His feedback. Left hand is very Conor McGregor style. Great power. I mean, guy's got 12 knockouts in his career. Got a good teep kick. Got a great high kick. Good calf, hard calf kicks. I mean, he was destroying a guy in the contender series with a step in knees. You know, the issue I have with him for such a great striker, he can throw a lot of single strikes instead of attacking combinations. Uh, I haven't seen too much of his offensive grappling, but his, his, his takedown offense is pretty strong. And and when he has been taken down, he does well to kind of pop right back up. Uh, I've been fading Giles, and, and I'm going to fade him moving forward. And I think, yeah, I, I do. I do agree that it's hard. Sometimes it's, it's hard to pick against Giles because of what you see. You're like, man, what if he just gets it all together? But 
and Paredes, you know, his, his, you know, UFC debut taking on, you know, Trevor Giles, that's a tough ask. I just think Paredes is a horrible style, stylistic matchup for Giles. I, I think Paredes just stays in Giles' face, batters with leg kicks, stepping knees, punches. And I think Giles' body fills him around about round two. So give me, give me Paredes by second round knockout. The six fight main card of UFC Vegas 86 begins with a middleweight matchup. The first of four middleweight matchups out of six main card fights between Rodolfo Vieira and Armin Petrosian. These two were actually scheduled to fight back at the beginning of November. Uh, they made it all the way through fight week, all the way through weigh-ins, and Petrosian fell ill. I want to say it was on weigh-in day, so it was either day of or day before the fight that, that he fell ill. But that was plenty of time for Keith and I to preview that fight. Keith, do you feel any differently about this fight than you did two months ago? No. No, I, I mean, I don't want to give away who I – it picked uh if you haven't seen you know didn't see it the first time but yeah, no i mean usually i'm not gonna change yeah uh just keep in mind when you listen to the preview that i'm about to plug in here the lines have drifted at the time in november it was a near pick em, but petrosian was just the slightest of favorites maybe his whoopsie tummy uh Gave the betters some doubt because now Vieira is just the slightest of favorites. He is minus 125, Petrosian available, even money, plus 100. Uh, sit back, relax, and enjoy this grainy black and white footage, and we'll be back in just a few minutes. The main card of UFC Fight Night 231 powers on with a 185-pound matchup between Rodolfo Vieira and Armin Petrosian. Vieira, the 34-year-old Brazilian, is 9-2. As a professional mixed martial artist, he is 4-2 and two in the UFC. He won his last time out, uh, tapped out Cody Brundage early in the second round back in April at UFC on ESPN Song versus Simone. That allowed him to bounce back from a frankly frustrating-looking decision loss to Chris Curtis last summer. He will look to make it two in a row and maximize his uh, remaining athletic prime against Petrosian. Uh, Petrosian, the 32-year-old Armenian by way of Russia, by way of... Uh, I can't remember where he trains now. Anyway, 9-2 uh, and two overall as well. 3-1 and one since joining the UFC out of the fifth season of Dana White's Contender Series. He is on a two-fight win streak uh, since his last loss, which was to Kyle Bahalio, who appears later on this card. He has back-to-back -back wins over AJ Dobson and Christian Leroy Duncan. The most recent of those, the Duncan win, was at the Vittori versus Cannoneer fight night back in June. Of all the fights on this card, this is the only pick -em. Both gentlemen out there at minus 110 or so, uh, depending on which book you look for. Keith, this is about as pure a uh, stylistic, old-school style versus style matchup as you're going to find on this card. I know who won most of the style versus style matchups in your single digit uh, UFCs, but yeah. uh, UFC Fight yeah. Night 231, who gets it done and how? Yeah, um, man. Well, yeah, it's definitely style versus style fight, obviously. Um, but it's funny because we think of a guy like Hadolf Vera as is a grappler, and obviously so. But if he was in this in the early UFCs. <laughs> he'd be one of the best strikers in the UFC, <laughs> you know. <laughs> he'd be like he'd be like freaking uh, Marco Huas or something. Uh, you know, he, he's, dude, he's dude, now. He, I want him to go out there in a pair of wrestling shoes and like red nose shorts, like the little booty shorts. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> um, he's a better striker than he gets credit for because he's he's such a great athlete. Um, I like his straight right. He hits super hard. Uh, he lands because his opponents are worried about his takedowns. Uh, and rightfully so. Uh, he lacks head movement, so he eats a lot of shots. Uh, but he can take some shots, and he's a lot tougher than than he gets credited for. I mean, it, not many people can eat the shots he did against Chris Curtis and, and continue to come. Um, earlier fights in the UFC, Anthony Hernandez, uh, Safarov, Saperbeck, Safarov, all landed some hard shots on him. Uh, he he is a strong wrestler. I mean, for a guy who's such a decorated grappler, I, I've described him before as a like a Hikado Arona in that sense, where uh, he's a top side grappler. He's got some good entries, uh, though he sometimes he doesn't he doesn't set up his entries with strikes. He'll shoot blindly um, and and kind of drive. He can drive through your hips. He's explosive in that sense, uh, but he doesn't chain wrestle as well as and doesn't 
cut the corners well because he's still, you know, a BJJ grappler, not your traditional, you know, American wrestler. Uh, he's very physically strong. You see him. Uh, obviously, he's a wizard on the ground. I mean, you go to his Wikipedia page and I mean, just the credentials just keeps going. All the awards and the high level, uh, you know, competition. We, we've read it before. I'm not going to read him again. Uh, he, but he's but it's not an exaggeration to, to call him maybe the best grappler that's transitioned to MMA this close to his athletic prime. Like he's a, he's he's yeah. in the team photo. Yeah, yeah, he's 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 one of the greatest grapplers in the history of of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Never mind, yeah. you know uh, MMA. Uh, but one issue I have is because he's so explosive, he carries so much muscle. He has that like Phil Baroni effect on him, where he's <laughs> he gassed out and yeah, you know, he looks so you know. Taking pictures on the beach, he looks good, but uh, because of that, as Joe Rogan always likes to say, you know, you carry all that money, you got to carry that oxygen with it. Uh, he's gassed out in fights. Matrosian is a really good striker. Uh, he moves well. He's elusive. Good footwork. Uh, it's funny. I've said this before about him, which is surprising. For guys, good striker. He actually circles to his opponent's power, which is very surprising. Um, but they were pointing that out, and I know I'm bringing it up for like the third time. <laughs> yeah, they were talking about. Uh, Tyson Fury actually does the same thing apparently. So uh he's 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 got some fast hands. He he throws straight shots down the pipe. He's got really good power. I mean, he's got five knockouts, incredible kicking game, throws a lot of kicks, kicks to the body, kicks to the calves, got a crushing high kick. Uh, he's not bad clinch fighter. His offer also offensive wrestling just it doesn't exist. And it's he's a very weak defensive wrestler. He's been taken down countless times in the UFC. Uh, and, but he's hard to hold down, and he's got good cardio, you know, that he can work hard all 15 minutes. I feel like this fight is is easy and hard to pick. It's easy because you there are really, in my opinion, two likely options. Not only there's a bunch of options that could happen, but two likely options. The first is either Vieira just takes him down subsequently. I mean, we, we've seen him get taken down by lesser wrestlers, and he just and, – and, you know, you get taken down by – Vieira, good luck. And, you know, that could happen. He could just get taken and is quickly subbed. Or Petrosian survives the early attack and picks him apart as Vieira fades. Now, Vieira shoots him for takedowns. He can't get him down. He's, you know, the take, stuff in the takedowns becomes easy and easier. He starts getting his legs kicked out on. He's eating punches. The, the reason why it's hard to pick, it, it's hard to figure out which one is actually going to happen. Uh, you, I love that you mentioned like the early UFCs because the early UFCs I would just laugh at this and go, "Oh, Vera's gonna take him down and, and submit him." And a part of me is saying, "Like, dude, what are you doing? Like, pick that. That's the most likely thing that's gonna happen." And, and I, I think he's gonna get him down. I, in, in, I think he's gonna dominate him early. But I'm gonna say somehow Petrosian survives and then he gets it back to the feet and then he kicks the legs and he stops some takedowns and gets taken down again and he somehow. You know, over time, he makes it harder and harder. And then I think he finally catches him. I think he's, Vieira starts to slow down and gas, and I think uh, I think Petrosian is going to start him with something. So uh, I think it's going to be like, you know, kick his legs and then go with a high kick or something like that. I'm going to say Petrosian does it. I'm going to say late in the first round. Give me Petrosian by first round TKO. All right. Uh, <clears throat> I I love the, the breakdown there, and obviously – the sport has advanced enormously in the 30 years since the fights you and I are thinking of. Uh, <clears throat> and, you know, fighters like Vieira and Petrosian have been you know, lifted with that tide. Petrosian has defended a takedown before. He at least knows what Vieira's techniques are, are called, even if, you know, whether or not he's able to defend them. It's not like Hoist Gracie tapping people out with something they can't even spell. Uh, but... <clears throat> At the heart of it, yeah, it's still the basic arms race that has informed this sport since the beginning. And it's always fun when we get one of those old school matchups on, uh, uh, you know, on on one of these cards. Uh, hell, dude, you and I are old school Sure Dog Radio Network listeners and callers from way back in the day. First time I ever really called in and talked to, you know, TJ DeSantis and Jordan Bream was back in, I guess it was 09 when Frank Mir fought Shet Congo which was, you know, a classic example of that yeah. type of, you yeah. know, um, where I said, you know, th this is the most obvious two true outcomes fight, both of which end in the first round, you know, that I, I, I can think of. But here, Vieira has made 
small incremental progress in a way that's in something that not a lot of fighters improve in because you and I, of course, we previewed and recapped his fight against Anthony Hernandez. There's a difference between getting tired and gassing out to the point where you are no longer functional. Uh, lots of fighters get tired. Almost every fighter gets tired. There are a few that never seem to break a sweat no matter what. I think I've never seen Demetrius Johnson tired. But we're about to preview a Derek Lewis fight. It's possible to breathe with your mouth wide open and yeah. still trying to win the fight and still keeping a few, you know, apples in your bag to, you know, to throw at the guy's head. Vieira, and I don't want to take too much away from Anthony Hernandez because he's one of our guys. We both love Anthony Hernandez, and that was such a, yeah. a great win for him. But there's a chance that the more measured Hodolfo Vieira that we've seen in the last year or year and a half doesn't gas out that badly, doesn't doesn't push himself too hard looking for the round one submission that he thinks everyone is expecting out of him and just goes ahead and just wins that first round maybe 10 to 8 maybe maybe not even 10 to 8 but leaves enough in the gas tank because what i've seen out of him in his last uh couple of fights is all of a sudden he has enough uh, gas to function in the second and third round of a fight that he's winning or even in the fight that he's losing, he had to be incredibly frustrated against Chris Curtis, one of the smallest guys in that division. And I don't know what his final takedown percentage was, but it was not good. And meanwhile, Curtis is just cutting angles on him, you know, cutting him up on, on the feet. And Vieta was tired in the third round. He was more tired than Curtis, but he wasn't non-functional. His arms weren't just hanging limply at his side, at his sides, you know? Uh, that gives me hope that if this thing goes past the first round, Vieira is still in it. Uh, I could see Petrosian knocking out Vieira. He is a, a good striker with good power. I love that you mentioned the circling thing. Uh, to me, of course, always the classic go-to example of a fighter who circled the quote-unquote wrong way would be Mirko Krokop. He knowingly circled towards his opponent's power because he trusted his speed and reflexes and liked that it made his left high kick come from more of a blind angle to his opponent. And it worked and worked and worked until it didn't. Uh, for Petrosian, so far, it's been working pretty well. But here, the crux of the matchup to me is still that Vieira's takedowns are surprisingly good for a BJJ guy. And Petrosian's defense is not particularly good even for a converted kickboxer at this point. I think Vieta gets Petrosian down. I wouldn't be too surprised if Vieta taps him out in the first round, just with one of his muscle man topside arm triangles. But if he doesn't get it in the first round, I'm now confident that he'll be able to try again in the second, which is what makes me feel better about picking him in this righteous pick and fight. Give me Vieta by second round submission. But uh, I can't wait to see what happens here. This is a, this is a fun kind of old school style versus style matchup. Next up on the UFC Fight Night 236 main card, lightweights take the cage as the ageless Michael Johnson welcomes Darius Flowers to the division. Johnson, the 37-year-old Missouri native, is 21 and 19 overall. He's 13 and 15 since joining the UFC out of season 12 of The Ultimate Fighter. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, you heard that right. Uh, he lost his last time out. He's lost... Uh, Six of his last eight, I think uh, eight of his last 12. It's been a rough couple of years for him, but uh, he fought most recently last May at the Dern versus Hill fight night, getting knocked out in the second round by Diego Fajeda. So he'll look to bounce back from that. We'll look to uh, continue to be by far the most prolific alum of season 12 of Tough, uh, you know, and, you know, yeah, I don't even know what else to say about that. At any rate, He'll be taking on Flowers. 29-year-old Iowa native is 12-6-1 overall. He's 0-1 since joining the UFC out of Season 6 of the Contender Series. He made his debut last July at UFC 291, getting choked out in the second round by Jake Matthews. That was enough to inspire him to move down from 170 to 155 pounds, where he'll make his debut here. Uh, your favorite? Keith is minus 150. Your underdog is plus 120. Who are they? 
Fuck, dude, I have no idea. Uh, uh, it's got to be Michael Johnson, the favorite. Your favorite is Michael Johnson. He's minus 150. Okay. Darius Flowers, plus 120. Tell me how you see this one going. Oh, man. Michael Johnson, like, I mean, do well, you really need me to break down Michael Johnson for them? Like, you know, uh, guy's been in the UFC forever, it seems like. Um, it's just like that annoying friend you can't get rid of just keeps coming back or, or like he, he's like that relative who comes over for like a birthday party or something and then you're know, like like you start packing up you clean you're cleaning up the table you you, you know kind of like sign like all right all right get, get going like that's how i feel with michael johnson i'm not saying it was a long time ago but who did he beat in his tough 12 semifinal to to make the finals Oh, okay. I have no idea. Uh, tough 12 semifinal. Um, I don't know he lo- who he lost to in the finals. He lost to... Jonathan Brookins, one of the mo- oh most more God. anonymous... Jonathan Brookins. Ever. Wow. Um, who did he beat? I, I have no idea. Um, like... I don't know. Just give it to me. I have no idea. Nam fan. Nam fan. There you go. <laughs> like to 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 go, stay on the Star Wars tip. Now that's a name I've not heard in a long, long time. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I forgot Nam fan was on the Ultimate Fighter show. So yeah, and he'd uh, already been in the UFC at that point. I think it may have been like a second chance or type thing for him. But yeah, it, it, it. okay. Yeah. Oof. Oh man, uh, M- Michael Johnson. You know, he's southpaw. He's a boxer. Uh, he, you know. He's obviously a faded guy, but he still has some some hand speed. I give him that. Basic straight punches down the pipe. Uh, I like that he t- still targets the body, plus power. But uh, I've said this before, Robin. He's he's not the hitter that the the UFC is going to pretend he is. Uh, he's a he's a solid offensive wrestler, but he prefers to box and doesn't wrestle enough. Good good defensive wrestler, uh, though. Uh, you no, know, actually, he even made like like Mike Mike DK, DK, uh, Mark DK, excuse me, uh, struggled to get him down. And, and, and like to guess he's a really good wrestler. Mm-hmm. The the biggest issue with his grapple is not his takedown defense. It's what it does hit the ground. And even if he's in the top position, he's been sub like nine times in his career. Uh, I'm also worried about the damage he's taken. I mean, he's been knocked out. It was knocked on his last fight, and yeah. he's been knocked out in a lot of fights. And he's you know you've been in the UFC as long as you're talking about Jonathan Perkins in the Ultimate Fighter. I, how many? How many do you think our listeners have no idea who Jonathan Perkins is? But I, I would imagine a lot half, of them. Half, half. But I mean, we, we draw a pretty old school crowd. Yeah, of course we do. Yeah, because I mean, these but, are the hardcores. But but even yeah, if you're we, hardcore, you're like, wait, Jonathan Perkins. Jonathan Perkins. Yeah, yeah. You look up his like Google him. Yeah, the yeah, like we. I mean, this is you know, if you listen to this show, you're the most hardcore of hardcores. Like we are made for the hardcores. Like I tell people yeah. that all the time. People are like, oh, give me, your, you know, what's your previous show? I'm like, oh, you're not really a hardcore. You probably don't want to watch my previous show. <laughs> like, like you just scroll the end if you want. Yeah, um, unless you want 11 minutes on the second prelim of the night between two tough alums. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. We're not for if, everybody. If you, if you want to hear me talking about uh, uh, Michael Johnson uh, being compared to you because you won't leave and you're asking me about my previous show and I'm trying to get close the door on you, <laughs> so. <laughs> Uh, Darius Flowers, I mean, he's a very low level UFC fighter. He's a minus athlete. He's flat footed. He is a brawler. Like he, he, he wants to get in the pocket and throw down. He has good power. He's, his kicking game is all right. He, he has high volume of kicks. The problem is, is not his offense, it's his defense. Particularly, he drops his hands. Uh, he's very hittable. He likes to wrestle, but he isn't very good at it. He is very strong. I'll give him that. He's a strong guy. So sometimes he can kind of make up for his lack of technique with just being powerful and grab, you know, picking up and slamming. But he's a bad defense wrestler. He's weak on bottom. I mean, Jake Matthews dominated him on the ground. Uh, he struggled to get up the entire time and he's been submitted a lot. <sighs> I've never had a strong take on, on Michael Johnson. You know, he, you know, reading the guy, he, he's always had, and I'm talking about like years ago, I'm not talking about right now. Uh, yeah, at this point in his career, but he's always had the physical tools to be a stud. And at moments, he has been. Tired. There was a time where, like he was rising up the rankings and, and looking like uh, could be a title challenger. But on the other hand, he always finds ways to lose to less talented guys. And at this age, 
it is safe to say that he's a mid card guy at best, and that might be being nice. But he has to be able to beat Darius Flowers. I mean, he's he's still better than Flowers pretty much everywhere. I say Johnson boxes him up. I say he keeps Flowers from the outside moves. If Flowers looks at Russell, I actually think Johnson wins that. I don't think Flowers is a submission threat to catch Johnson. I, I want to take Johnson by stoppage. I just don't trust Johnson's power. I think it's overrated. So give me Johnson by decision. Yeah, you pretty much summed it up there. There was a time when Michael Johnson was maybe the most enigmatic fighter. Well, he was definitely the most enigmatic fighter in the UFC. One of the most enigmatic in the history of the UFC. I mean, we're talking about a guy that up through 2016, he was the first fighter to beat Edson Barboza without taking him down. Like the first one to kind of show the path that other fighters went on to follow. He's He was the last guy to beat Tony Ferguson before he went on, on the 12 fight win streak. He lamped Dustin Poirier and it was probably Poirier's worst loss, you know, outside of championship fights in his entire career. Like there was a time when he had elite top five quality wins, but then would just get tapped out by guys that didn't belong in the cage with him. Like we're talking about a guy that got heel hooked by Paul Sass. Like, but that guy's gone at this point. <laughs> yeah, there's, a, there's a name right there. <laughs> I mean, I, I maybe it's a moral victory that he didn't get triangled because, like, yeah. Sass was the guy that had like ten yeah, straight triangles. Like, yeah. yeah, yeah, he's like the British Cody McKenzie, like he was the, the, the British <laughs> triangle instead. Of, yeah, but at at this point, the the Poirier fight is Johnson's last really good win, and that was almost eight years ago. He's been <coughs> he's been losing to the good fighters. He's been losing to the middling fighters. And just occasionally snatching up a, a, a win here and there, just enough to keep himself on roster. Uh, he used to be really, really durable. That's gone. He got clocked, like one-shotted by Diego Fajeda, a grappling specialist who's not really known for his power. And is about 80% shot himself. Uh, Johnson is on his last legs. And I'm with you. If he can't beat Darius Flowers, it might be time. We're already talking about a guy who's c- creeping up on that, like Sam Alvey territory of like, what's it going to take uh, for this guy to get cut? And Flowers might be the only guy in this entire division that Johnson would be a moderate favorite over like this. I'll I'll give Flowers this much. Like, I don't think he's UFC material. But I am, I do think, and this is the same thing I said about Pete Rodriguez last week, whatever future he has in the UFC is probably at 155. He got manhandled by Jake Matthews, but part of the problem is that Matthews was twice his size. Uh, it, I mean, he's not quite like doughy like Pete Rodriguez, but he's a short squat guy that looked really undersized at welterweight. And he fought at welterweight even on the regional scene. But like, I, I'm surprised he never tried to cut to 155 before. Cutting the 155, I, I have the feeling he's going to cut kind of that Drew Dober, Michael Chandler figure where, yeah, I'm I'm shorter than all my opponents, but I'm just this this chunk of muscle, and I am really athletic and strong, and, you know, maybe I'll make it work. I just don't think he'll make it work against Michael Johnson. Uh, if he catches Johnson clean, uh, I think Johnson's chin is going. He could certainly hurt him there, but I... I don't think he's going to be able to. Uh, Johnson is still pretty slick on the feet, still has good head movement, still like, unless Johnson like makes a real bad mistake or gets caught showboating, I, I think you'll be able to just kind of slap flowers up uh, at, you know, kind of the outside of boxing range. He's going to have a hell of a lot of reach on him. If flowers tries to crash in and get big takedowns on, on Johnson, I think he's going to have tough going at it. And I think Johnson will probably punish him for trying. And while Johnson's defensive grappling is probably his worst single skill, Flowers' is is even worse. And Johnson actually has a little bit of offensive submission game to him. Like, he'll at least threaten with stuff from topside. So I don't think the ground will be a particularly safe place for Flowers either. This is about as favorable a matchup as Michael Johnson has in the UFC lightweight division in 2024. And... 
I think minus 150 is right about where it should sit. Like he's a better fighter, but he's still prone to throwing away fights. He should win. And flowers does have some weapons to him. Give me Johnson by a uh, decision here, but not a ton of confidence in it. And it would be nice if he like put on something resembling a vintage performance to kind of justify his continued roster spot. If he struggles with flowers, I might have him on my Shillin and Duffy cut list off a win. Absolutely. Oh, off a win. Oh, yeah. Because, wow. and thinking of it from the UFC point of view, he has 14 years of pay increases. Like, he's probably one of the more expensive guys on the roster that's never been a champ. Yeah. You'd have to ask one of the business guys about that. Yeah, you might be right. Like, he, he would have got grandfathered in right at the top level of the Venom sponsorship. Like, he's probably making like 60K a fight from Venom alone. Like, wow. yeah. That's right. Still, yeah, you're right. I'd cut him just for that. <laughs> <laughs> next up on the ufc vegas 86 main card is another middleweight matchup this one eternal gatekeeper slash fringe contender brad tavares against gregory rodriguez tavares the 36 year old hawaiian by way of las vegas is 20 and 8 overall he is 15 and 8 since joining the ufc as the I believe the final remaining guy on roster out of season 11 of the ultimate fighter. So he's from the season, even the one before Johnson. I'm not sure whether court McGee is still officially on roster or not at best. It's those two left. Uh, but Tavares is certainly the only one left. That's any semblance of his former self. Uh, and that's because he was like 20 years old when he was on the ultimate fighter. And McGee, I think was already 42 uh, at any rate. Uh, he won his last time out, took a unanimous decision over Chris Weidman last August at UFC 292. That allowed him to bounce back from back-to-back -back defeats against Drickus Duplessis and Bruno Silva. He'll look to make it two wins in a row against uh, Rodriguez, who is also coming in off a win. The 31-year-old Brazilian is 14-5 and five overall. He is 5-2 and two since joining the UFC as a veteran of Season 4 of Dana White's Contender Series. He lost on the Contender Series, went and won back-to-back -back fights in LFA, then got signed. Since then, 5-2. and two. He won his last time out, knocking out Dennis Jalulin in like a minute and a half, allowing him to bounce back from a first-round knockout loss to Bruno Fajera last January. So uh, two gentlemen looking to string together a new win streak. Rodriguez is a big favorite to get it done. He is minus 240, Tavares plus 190. Uh, on the comeback. Wow. I, I'm glad you said, wow. Like Tavares is starting to slip just ever so slightly. It seemed mm -hmm. like he was never going to get old. Just again, he was so young when he came to the UFC. And I, I always make the joke that the best thing that ever happened to Neil Magny was being on tough because he decided he liked fighting every two weeks. And that's, you know, <laughs> like and how he made his bones. Uh, <laughs> Joking aside, best thing that ever happened to Brad Tavares was tough because he just stayed in Vegas. He was doing the thing at Extreme Couture long before COVID, long before it became kind of yeah. the, the new mecca of mixed martial arts. Uh, <laughs> Some people always stay in Vegas, but not my yeah. choice. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, but uh, I mean, if I was from Hawaii, it'd take a hell of a lot to make me stay in Vegas. Anyway. Yeah, yeah, uh, that's a good point. <laughs> And forever, he was a guy that would just always kind of skirt the bottom of the top 15, maybe scoot up a little bit, you know. Uh, he won four in a row between his losses to Whitaker and Adesanya, and he probably creeped into the top 10 there. Uh, he's been within a win or two uh, of a title shot. Like when Adesanya nuked Tavares, I think he had only had to win one more fight before he got his title shot. At it, but I mean, that's at his very best. It, like what he's really been in is a, a gatekeeper to the top 10 for over a decade now. Like if you can beat Brad Tavares, you belong in the top 10. If you don't, Tavares is going to handle you. He's very well-rounded. He's athletic. For a guy who's not huge for the weight class, he never seems out-muscled by his opponents. Although Drickus Duplessis and Bruno Silva were kind of the first two where, okay, these guys are kind of pushing Brad Tavares around a little bit. And I think that's, an indication of him maybe just starting to slip a tiny bit. Plus the fact that the sport has advanced in the 14 years since he, he was on tough. Uh, but he's still a 
tough out, no pun intended. I'm surprised that the line is this wide against Rodriguez because while Rodriguez is still a really dangerous fighter, we're kind of starting to see his limitations. Like when he came to the UFC and just started blowing people up and he was just this, you know, freakishly strong athletic guy who uh, claims to be a, a grappler and clearly is a grappler by training, even though he has way more knockouts. Like, is this guy a future title contender? Is he a future title challenger? Like, and he was only like 27 or 28 years old, even though he, you know, kind of like, had that grizzled face but we've seen now and he kind of reminds me of a brazilian roman de Lidze. he is going to get exactly as far as as he is able to bully people uh fighters yeah. who are more durable than he is uh can outlast him he does get tired yeah. fighters who are just classy or better schooled strikers than him and aren't phased by the freakish ag aggression can figure him out because of that, I'm surprised that he's uh, like two to two and a half to one favorite over Tavares. Because if he doesn't nuke Tavares in the in the first round, I like Tavares the more this fight goes along. Uh, I don't think it's a given that he's just going to be able to find Tavares's chin at will. Like Tavares is, he's never had the fastest hands, and he's never had the greatest footwork, but he's pretty good at both. He tends to keep his chin tucked. And I don't think it's a given that Rodriguez is just going to be able to crash in, hoist Tavares, and throw him to the ground. He's always had pretty good defensive wrestling. And in the thing that I say about every Hawaiian fighter, he has surprisingly good offensive wrestling that he doesn't use often enough. Uh, this feels like it was booked as a rebuilding fight for Rodriguez. And I think it said it's kind of a trap fight. The line is big here. But give me Tavares to pull off the upset here. Maybe he loses the first round. Un sees some serious scares, but I think Tavares will be the fresher guy as the fight goes along. I could see him turning the Jets up and maybe taking down a tired Rodriguez in, in the third round. I can see him starting to get the better of the striking exchanges, maybe where he's getting pushed around in the clinch early. He's doing the work late, but give me Tavares to just gut out a tough win and let everybody know that, hey, you know, I'm, I'm still here. I may never be a champ, but uh, I'm not going anywhere yet. Yeah, that'd be a really good winner one if he does that. Um, I yeah, I I'm surprised by that big of a line um, based on the, all the issues you said with Rodriguez and and the craftiness of of Tavares, a, a veteran that's been around and beaten some good guys in his career, and, and you know coming off a big win. I mean, I, I guess a big win over Chris Weidman at this point. Uh, big name, <laughs> yeah, big name, yeah, that's yeah, that's a big well, big name, big card too. So. Uh, you know, Tavares is well rounded. You know, and I think about his career over the years. He's, you know, he's this guy. He's he's never had a major flaw over the years. There wasn't something like when you think of Brett Tavares, you're like, oh, this is how you beat Brett Tavares because this. On on the flip side, and this is probably what's held him back from you know going on a higher level is, I've also never seen major improvements where it's like, oh wow, did you see Brett? Tavares, what he did, you know, that last fight, like, you know, what he does now. Uh, he's a boxer that is that is technical. He uses feints well. Uh, he's strong at slipping and ripping. Uh, I say okay pop, but not really a, a big power puncher. Uh, though he did, despite he does have pretty good foot positioning. Uh, he's good at, you know, you know, keeping his base under him and everything. He's, he's physically kind of strong guy. Though he is... Though he is pretty good outside, he can be sucked into the pocket and, and throw it out at time. He he makes some mistakes of backing straight up and, and playing uh, with his back against the fence instead of circling away. That's that's what kind of I thought cost him a, a, the fight against straight against Duplessis. Like he was doing well, but but du Duplessis was just you know pressure him again. That's obviously a loss that has aged really well. You know the current champion. Uh, he's he's had has a good kicking game. Uh, I love when he rips the body, uh, mean calf kicks. I think he needs to kick even more. And he's a bit bigger part of his game. He can wrestle, but he, he uh, he's really abandoned it lately. Uh, he's always had a good takedown defense, a uh, bit of like a sprawl and brawl guy, underrated grappler. Uh, I, you know, the the big concern, and, and, and obviously this is a lot of people, and I'm sure this is what the betting line is. It's I'm just concerned about his longevity in the UFC. I mean, he's you you said you started with it. He's been slipping. I, I agree with that. Like he's showing signs, and you can get old overnight. It can happen instantly. 
He's taken a lot of damage. Um, he's been knocked out a few times in this, you know, like half dozen fights recently. He's been two or three times. So that's concerning. Uh, Rodriguez, he's, I mean, a really big guy. For a guy who's ripped and big and you think he would, would control his pace, he doesn't. He comes out high, high output, marching forward, throwing big power shots. Uh, he loves to get in the pocket and throw down, throwing absolute heat, you know, particularly big hooks. Elite strikers can can pick up his timing because he loads up so much. Uh, and he also just abandons defense. He's taking a lot of damage. Um, but he trusts in, – in that's because he's just going to overwhelm him with this, like, like ferocity that he can do. And like you said, if he can bully you, he's going to win. Uh, he – He's not just regular. Like, actually, probably even better in his grappling. He can close the distance, and he can, he can wrestle. I like his upper body locks. Uh, besides getting inside and tripping upper body, he can, he can blast through your hips. Though he will sometimes, because of it, will kind of just duck and like reach for singles, like kind of snatch singles and stuff, um, which is not the most technical. But, he, but he's so freaking strong that if he grabs your leg, he can like just pick you right up in, in the air and, and slam. Uh, if the, if it fights hits the ground, that's where he kind of shines. He's a very strong top side grappler. Mean ground and pound. He has legit submission throughout, you know, sub- submissions. And the one thing I for a guy, he rushes submission. He won't control the position. He'll he'll try to like rush his submission. And he's like you mentioned it, he has faded a lot in the past. Tavares is is definitely the more polished fighter, even at this point in their career. In his prime, if this was I don't know, four years ago, Tavares. Like you could go in a time machine. I, I'm taking Tavares huge. Like I think Tavares pieces him up. And I, I think that Tavares would style them. It's just like how close is he to that guy? I just I don't trust his chin anymore. I I really I hate taking picking against Brad Tavares. He's kind of been one of my guys that I've always supported and kind of liked. Kind of thought he was a criminally underrated. Like 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 I don't know, like the Kirk Cousins of <laughs> middleweight, like just gets the job done. Or I just, I don't know. I think Rodriguez turns us to war, and and I think this might be the beginning of the end of for Tavares's chin. I say he catches Tavares early. I'm gonna say Rodriguez knocks him out in the first round. All right, a little bit of disagreement on the main card of UFC Vegas 86. You know, we disagreed, but really didn't. Like, we disagreed on, like, who wins, but, like, I think we started the kind of the same way. Yeah. Like, like the, like, the, the line is off. Like, if Tavares, if, like, exactly, said, if Tavares survives a, a, a flurry and, and takes over, like, you know, three minutes into the fight, like, that wouldn't surprise me one bit. The third of four middleweight fights on the main card of UFC Fight Night 236 is next as Robert Brychek takes on late replacement Eeyore Pateria. Brychek, the 33-year-old Pole, is 17-5 and five overall. This will be his UFC debut. He uh, fought most recently in Octagon MMA, where he mounted a three-fight win streak to uh, draw the attention of the, the Ultimate Fighting Championship. Fought most recently last July, knocking out Samuel Kristofic in like a minute. Uh, he had been scheduled to take on Albert Durayev. Durayev fell out within the last uh, two weeks or so, so in steps Pateria. 27-year-old Ukrainian is 19-5 and five overall. He is 1-3 and three since joining the UFC out of Season 5 of Dana White's Contender Series. He has losses to Nick Nigamarianu, Carlos Olberg, and Hadolfo Bellato, all by uh, knockout, sandwiched around a, I would say, a win, but more like an exorcism of the ghost of Mauricio Shogun Hua uh, last January. So, uh, Poteria? Steps in on short notice. I believe this is the first fight on a new deal for him, but either way, uh, you know, gets a little bit of goodwill from the UFC probably. And uh, according to the odds makers, at least he will need it as Brychek is a moderate favorite. He's minus 180, Pateria plus 150 uh, on the comeback. Robert Brychek is going to be fun for as long as he sticks around. Like I know he came to the UFC through Octagon, which is uh, the Czech Republic's top promotion and really has made big strides in in the last few years. Like I openly mocked him like two years ago, but at this point they're one of the better promotions in continental Europe, like in Western Europe, trying to aim to be like the Czech KSW. And that's where I'm going with this because Brychek 
even though he comes from Octagon, he is a pure KSW fighter. He is a short, burly, like just jacked muscle, uh, yeah. uh hundred muscle yeah, guy who walking down the beach I mean, yeah they'll they'll announce him as a kickboxer but he's a slugger like he he can kick he's got some good ones but uh mostly he he throws punches they're not terribly straight so he's making his own modest reach even worse but uh he does at least throw them in combination throws flurries they all have heat on them and even at 185, which is not the most skilled division and not the deepest division, that would not be a recipe for longevity. But against this opponent in particular, against Pateria, it should be all he needs. I I swear I'm not just hating on Pateria because it made me so mad to see him like kill Shogun. But the problem is the other three guys he, he's fought they've been able to do whatever they want to him. Like Carlos Olberg was a terrible matchup because he was a bigger, better trained, more athletic and kickboxer. A and he's a yeah, killer. And, yeah, just, just destroyed him. But, uh, you know, Nega Mariano was not bigger than Pateria and just beat him to the punch repeatedly. Uh, kind of same for, for Bilado. Pateria just, he's not defensively sound. He's not athletic. He's decently sized, but he's not Olberg decently sized. He's not a, like a giant dude. He, he's only 27. There's every chance he can turn around. I, I mean, if you'd, to stick with another Ukrainian, if you'd asked me about Nikita Krylov's upside in his mid-20s, as he was like washing out of the UFC, I would have laughed. I'd be like, that dude's never coming back. He's terrible. And came back and became a top 10 fighter. So yeah, never point. say never. But the version of Eeyore Pateria that we've seen right now has only even been competitive with the ghost of Shogun Hua. Like, that's it. Uh, Brychek is not a future top 15 guy in this division, but Brychek's going to uh, march forward. He's going to keep Pateria on his back foot. Pateria's probably going to try to keep him, like, on the outside, but he backs straight up. He's he's not going to like he normally likes to kick, but he's not going to kick at all with Brychek coming right at him. And I think Brychek's just going to I mean, this might be over quick. I, I, not only do I think Brychek knocks him out in the first round, I think he probably knocks him out in like the first three minutes. Uh, Brychek's going to look like a million bucks here. He might collect 50,000 bucks. Uh, give me Robert Brychek by first round knockout. <laughs> hmm. You hate that. You hate P <laughs> Pretoria. <laughs> I, I swear I don't hate him. <laughs> It was was he like Trevor Giles' partner when you get arrested? <laughs> uh, well, now this has become like an Interpol thing. It's like a the, the Ukrainian. Thing. Like, well. um, did I constantly? I feel like I'm constantly checking Fight Finder to confirm that Victoria is only 27. He just seems so much older than that. I mean, he's still mm -hmm. really young, and especially for that division. Uh, he's a southpaw. He fights in this very like bladed Taekwondo styles. You know, like Marcy Pragno is, is, you know, has a very similar style to him, but he's like the much better version of, of Pragno. Um, well, let me say he's he's a better version. I should say much. I should say much when it comes to pure, but but um, yeah, he's, he's better athlete. I should say like he's like he's got quick hands. He, you know, he attacks with combinations, uh, though there a lot of times they're looping punches. He has some underrated power. So like he's got like decent speed, decent power. Um, but defensively, the big thing, he, he doesn't move his head. He keeps his chin high in the air. Uh, he likes to wrestle, uh, and he has six subs, but you know, he struggles to get the fight to the ground, and he gasses. I mean, he besides getting pieced up and, and, and lack of defense against Nega Romano and, and Bellato, like he gassed in those two fights against lower-level guys. Now, yeah, um, Oberg, it is what it is. Oberg's a freaking stud. So, yeah. like, what do you, what do you, yeah, in, in and out of the cage? But, um, you know, against those guys, that that's not a good look. Um, Bryce Jack on the feet, you know, I haven't seen this. Is one of the guys I wish I'd spent more time tape studying because I was, you know, like I said, I was distracted this weekend. Um, but I've seen, I mean, he, I, I like what I see. This guy's a very aggressive striker. And like, again, I, I agree with what you said, like, not the most polished guy, but he's fun, man. He says some his shots well with fans. He's got serious, serious power. He throws heat, um, like, 11 KOs. He's got, he's got, he's just wild man out there. Like, he's moving forward the second the bell rings, throwing big shots. Uh, he is heavy on his front foot, so he's open to, to leg ticks. 
the leg kicks, which which is concerning. Um, the times I've seen him hit the ground in more of a scramble kind of thing, but when he gets on top. He's he's still aggressive. He's still like throwing hard, kind of like a Johnny Walker style ground, ground and pound. Uh, if I'm Pretoria, I'm closing distance. I'm, I'm I'm not getting a brawl, and I'm I'm trying to wrestle. I just don't think it's coming. I think Bryce just catches them, pieces them up. I'm with you. I think he hurts him with some body shots, finishes up with some big punches. Give me Bryce Jack my first round of TKO. The co-main event of UFC Vegas 86 is a featherweight matchup between Dan Ige and late replacement Andre Feely. Ige, the 32-year-old Hawaiian by way of uh, Las Vegas, much like his longtime teammate Brad Tavares, uh, is 17 and 7 overall. He is 9 and 6 since joining the UFC out of season one of Dana White's contender series. He did lose his last time out. Uh, he took on Bryce Mitchell at UFC Fight Night Fizzy versus Gamrot in September, dropping a unanimous decision. Prior to that, uh, he had opened up last year with back-to-back -back wins over Damon Jackson and Nate Landwehr. He'll look to get back in the win column here against uh, Feely. Uh, Ike had been scheduled to take on Laurent Murphy. Murphy dropped out of uh, dropped out of the fight, so in steps Feely. 33-year-old uh, Californian is 23-10 and 10 with one no contest overall. He is 11-9 and nine with one no contest since joining the UFC out of literally every single promotion in California. Uh, he's coming in off a win. He knocked out Lucas Almeida in the first round at UFC 296 in December. Prior to that, uh, he dropped a unanimous decision to Nathaniel Wood in, at UFC London in July. Odds here? Considering the late notice, pretty close. But Ige is a moderate favorite. He's minus 180, Feely plus 150. Uh, Keith, neither of these guys is uh, probably a future contender at no. 145. Like, you know, I, I think we've seen Ige ceiling. And frankly, it's kind of a cool story that Feely is still this competitive after the wars he's been in period yeah. like it's shocking mm -hmm. that he's just 33 but uh tell me how you see this one going and uh yeah tell me who wins yeah at this point of their careers it's more about just getting fun fights and fun matches for them i mean they've kind of both kind of hit their peak um but it was good i mean it was, it was good rise what they've been able to do especially Ige. like he, he obviously met, made it higher up than, than feely did uh he gets a well-rounded fighter, you know, pressure striker, good, good volume, attacks the combination. It's pretty accurate. He loves getting in the pocket and unloading some hard shots. Uh, he likes his counter right hand and, and his, his left hook. Uh, I'd love that he like went, works the body. I and mean, then go back to like the Damian Jackson fight. That's a perfect example of, of, of good body shots. Duke can crack. He has serious power. Again, the knockout of Damian Jackson was a beautiful thing. thing that was set up earlier from the body shots. Uh, good leg kicks. Uh, he, you know, if he's going, you know, he, you know, he struggles with distance. He'll like throw a flying knee to close the distance. Underrated wrestler. Um, more, more, not a technical wrestler, more of like an opportunistic. Like he knows the good timing uh, on it. He's, he's good at um, wrestling kind of when his opponent decides to start striking. Like it kind of open up like that. Oh, we got we got to throw it out of the pocket. Okay. Nope. As, as I start to open up, he gets on my hips. Um, he he though he does need to improve his takedown offense. You go back to like the Bryce Mitchell fight, he was taken down more than and that's probably cost him a, you know a very close fight, cost him fight. But it's a good overall grappler. I mean, good top game, busy ground and pound, has the cardio, uh, you know, cardio is no question. He can go hard all 15 minutes. The big question with him at this point of his career is what does he have left in in in, in you know the durability. I mean, he's taken a lot of damage. I mean, the Edson Barbosa fight was ridiculous about the damage took that, Calvin Cater. Chan Sung Jung, I mean, Josh Emmett, most of our evolution. I mean, there was like five, six fights in a row of taking damage against the killers. Um, Feely, you know, a lot, a lot of similar boxes. He's a, he's a well-rounded fighter. He can fight out of both stances. He's much bigger than he gay. He, he likes he likes to counter uh, where he's a very technically sound striker, throws straight shots down the pipe, quick hands, nice long jab. Faints well to set up his power shot. He likes like fade back counters, has good power. I mean, go back to the, the you know his last fight. Lucas Almeida blasted that guy, uh, which is which is good to see that he still has some you know big power in, in his hands. Good kicks. He loves that like Robert Whitaker dip to one side, throw a high kick to the other side thing. Wrestling is such a big part of his game, and he's he's underrated at it. He he needs to improve his top control though. Like I think that comes from not 
being a a high level wrestler, just more of like MMA wrestler. Uh, he he isn't a submission threat, and if you take him down, he kind of struggles off his back. Uh, you know, I go back to like Sadiq Yusuf and Bryce Mitchell taking him down and holding him down. I am also a little worried about his chin, not to the extent that I am with Dan Ige, but he's taken some damage over the years, especially, you know, really recently. I mean, he was knocked out by Joe Anderson Brito. He was hurt multiple times by Nathaniel Wood. So, the, you know, the winner of this fight is is still going to be, you know, pretty relevant in the division, not in the sense like you're, you're a top contender, but like you're going to be used to, to be a challenge for the other, you know, rising guys or a, a good quality fill in when when a, you know a top guy gets hurt the other guy is is really gonna fall to like the mid card so uh i think the fight is tough to call because i really like both guys you know i i've always like i think both guys have been criminally underrated throughout their careers i i think they're really tough outs for anybody i think they're both kind of crafty i am going to go with ige due to his power uh, i am worried a little bit about feely's durability again not to the extent of Ige, but Ige has, is a much of a harder hitter. I say Ige hurts him several times, but but isn't able to completely finish him. Give me Ige by decision. Yeah, I, I like basically every point of your breakdown there, especially the part about the tread off the tires. These guys are 32 and 33 respectively, but it's an old 32 and an old 33. And in Feely's case, it makes sense because it feels like he's been in the UFC for a million years. Uh with Ige, it all happened pretty quickly because, you know, he yeah. got signed out of that first season of the Contender Series, and he wasn't one of the the standout highlight guys of that first season. Like, no. all the attention the first season was around guys like Jeff Neal. Obviously, like, Greg Hardy drew a ton of attention just because he was Greg Hardy. Ige was just a guy that kind of quietly got signed. He lost, like, either his first or his second fight in the UFC, and that dampened the hype even more. And next thing you knew, he won six in a row, and when he – went to take on uh, Calvin Cater in the headliner of UFC on ESPN 43 uh, or 13, like three and a half years ago. Like there, there was a basically a, there, there was a top five spot up for grabs there. Like Cater won that and he went on to fight Max Holloway in his next fight. Like yeah. so he gets high watermark. He was well into the top 10 and mm-hmm. he was one win away from being at least peripherally in the title title picture. That's pretty remarkable for a guy who is undersized and came to the UFC with such modest expectations. But the cater fight is kind of an indication like Ige. He is extremely well coached. He's another guy that's been in extreme couture forever, like since before it was cool. Uh, and he himself is an extremely smart fighter. And because of that, he is not in the habit of losing fights that he shouldn't. He's well-rounded. Like on a scale of one to 10, he's probably like a seven everywhere. The people that have beaten him are people that have an elite skill somewhere. Like as good a striker as Ige is, as good a power as he has, as durable as he is, like Cater really outclassed him on the feet. Like Cater like just cut him to pieces on the feet in the same way that Holloway did to Cater in his very next fight. Like, Eve Loyev and Mitchell, as good a wrestler and grappler as Ige is, both of them just gave him fits there. So if you can do something at a truly elite level, you can probably beat Danny Ige. The one exception is the Barboza fight. And honestly, I thought Barboza should have beaten Ige. Like it was a great fight, but you know, I, I gave Barboza two rounds out of three there. Uh, yeah, I did too. Just the question is how long Ige can continue to do this? Because as you pointed out, there are about five fights in a row where he was just in absolute wars and took a ton of punishment, dealt a ton of punishment. Uh, There's a lot of tread off the tires for 32. With Feely, it is remarkable. Like as long as he's been in the UFC and he's fought some of the very best guys and then he's fought, you know, some uh, that weren't so great. He's still never lost back-to-back fights in the UFC. That's pretty remarkable. Like he's just always kind of there always fun to watch. And yeah, it's just a a cool story that he's still around here. They are similar in their approach. They're both good strikers, underrated slash underused wrestlers. But even though Feely like will be bigger by the eyeball test, he's kind of like the longer lankier guy where Ige is more short and compact. I think Ige is a slightly better wrestler and I think he hits harder. And I think that's going to make the difference in this fight. I think if Ige wants it on the ground, it might not be easy, but I, I think he has a good chance of getting it there. I don't know if the reverse is necessarily true. And if one guy really hurts the other on the feet, it's probably Ige. So 
for him to have those things in his back pocket where, yeah, maybe he's getting outstruck by a clip of like two to one, but he lands one or two shots that really send Feely stumbling across the cage and just wins those rounds on power and damage. That's something that he has a better chance of doing than Feely. And again, I think wrestling is more of a safety valve for him. Uh, just the matchup of his offensive against Feely's defensive wrestling. Because of that, I do lean Ige in this fight, but it should be a whole hell of a lot of fun. Uh, not a bad consolation prize at all, considering that Laurent Murphy, as a technically undefeated fighter, it's a more prestige matchup, but probably wouldn't be nearly as much fun. With that, we come to the main event of UFC Fight Night 236, a middleweight clash between perennial contender Jack Hermanson and red-hot rising prospect Joe Pfeiffer. Hermanson, the 35-year-old Swede by way of Norway, is 23-8 and eight overall. He is 10-6 and six in the UFC. He's alternated wins and losses for his last eight fights now. Uh, he is coming in off a loss. He competed most recently all the way back in December of 2022, uh, where he got knocked out late in the second round by Roman Delize from a position that looked like Sting's scorpion deathlock, basically. Uh, Delize calf cuttered him, and then instead of cranking on that, just used it to pin Hermanson down, face down, and punch his block off from back mount. Uh, fantastic finish, propelled Delize further up the rankings, but it's taken Hermanson just a little over a year to uh, get back to the cage and waiting for him will be a guy that uh, has had a busy time while he was gone. Pfeiffer, 27 year old Pennsylvanian is 12 and two overall. He's three and zero since joining the UFC as a two time veteran of the contender series. He competed on season four, uh, was injured late in the first round against Dustin Stoltzfus Uh, came back, well, came back to action over a year later, came back to the contender series like a year and a half later, knocked out Osman Diaz to earn his UFC contract. And since then, he has won back-to-back-to-back fights over Alan Amadovsky, Gerald Mearshart, and Abdul Razak Al-Hassan, all within the distance. Most recent of those, the Al-Hassan fight was in October. Uh, He choked him all the way out with a very, very tight-looking arm triangle choke. So he'll look to make it four in a row, take down his first uh, ranked opponent, propel himself into the rankings and perhaps into the title picture sooner than later. He is comfortably favored to do so. Pfeiffer is minus 225, Hermanson plus 185. Uh, I'm interested in, in, in your take on this one, man. Like, obviously, yeah. the, the UFC right, has yeah. a bunch of push behind Pfeiffer. Uh, He's got the, he's got the story. Like he lost on the contender series, got injured and was affected. He was essentially homeless. He was living in his car on, uh, you know, on the street. Dana White took a personal interest in him, like basically paid for a apartment for him for a year so he could recover. White's investment slash largesse was rewarded when Pfeiffer came back like a man possessed on the contender series two seasons later. And since then, I mean, he's been smashing people. Uh, yeah. And while Alan Amadovsky is no great shakes, Gerald Mearshart is a very good fighter who has skirted the, the bottom of the rankings himself a few times. Abdul Razak al Hassan is a dangerous, but flawed fighter. And, Pfeiffer ran him over in what's supposed to be uh, his own realm. I mean, Mr. Judo Thunder got just throttled with a topside submission. Yeah, you you mentioned, and I, I think it may have been off camera. It may have been between segments. Uh, the the UFC doesn't really coddle or protect its its hot prospects. Like, yeah. if anything, they, they they it's nothing like boxing where you you're going to get to 16 and 0 before you even fight someone with yeah. a pulse yeah uh, people say sorry it's right people say that like yeah show us perfect like, i'm sure you could name one guy who got cuddled but generally speaking like generally speaking like bellator yeah. bellator was way slower on the rise with their guys than yeah. than ucr like oh. adrian mckeef had like 20 fights before he fought anybody serious yeah. yeah for like and everyone thinks the opposite because aaron pico but for every one aaron pico there's a million like Joey Davis's and AJ yeah. McKee's yeah, that, yeah. I mean, they take eight fights to even bring them out of the prelims and they're just fighting yeah. low, low level guys. And we're not saying that as a criticism. Like I wish uh, the UFC would do I, more I, of it. I, I just think that it should be somewhere between the two. Yeah. I won't say that the UFC is coddling Pfeiffer. 
but I will say that if they wanted to get him a top 15 ish, top 12, top 15 ish opponent, this is one of the more favorable matchups they could find in, in that realm. I, I, oh, wow. I, oh, if you disagree, no, I, I, no, I, I, I just, not, not that, I mean, is he, is, is he more favorable of the top 50? Yeah, maybe, maybe if you say top, but like, this is a big stuff up in competition. No, no, it's, it's, he is dangerous. Like he, he has that same type of, if you make a mistake, I'm going to make you pay real bad thing that Mearshart does only with far better striking, far better athleticism. Yeah, no, like I, I'm not saying that Hermanson is, is a walkover at all. I'm surprised that the line is as wide as it is because this is such a step up because right now Pfeiffer has, impressive physical gifts like he is a big powerful 185 pounder outstanding athlete hits like a truck but the skill set that he's flexed in his fight so far is pretty basic like he throws with a ton of power but it's a fairly basic repertory uh, repertoire of strikes uh, and uh, basic combinations uh he has a good takedown game but it's one that runs on horsepower rather than than technique it's you know uh it's the jacare takedown game it's not the dominant cruise takedown game uh like right now he feels like a very elite raw prospect um i i've been going back and forth on this one for weeks now uh just because this feels like such a trap fight this is I, I just well I, I mean I just keep thinking back to Hermanson's win over Kelvin Gastelum where just one moment of inattention and the fight was over. Delizze like the way that Delizze kind of overpowered and, and bullied Hermanson is something Pfeiffer could do even if that particular position they ended up in was one in a million like Pfeiffer is not going to be looking for calf slicers uh, on people. Like, I'm going Piper here. I, I've seen Hermanson be hurt badly when, you know, when he's caught clean by people with good power. And while he's a well-schooled striker and he's defensively sound, he's not very athletic or fast. <sighs> yeah, I, if I were a betting man, I would steer way clear of this one. Uh, I'm leaning Piper, and I think if Piper wins, it is probably by finish. I'm thinking... Pfeiffer probably struggles with Hermanson in the early going. Maybe just overwhelms him with aggression in the second round, catches him with something big. Maybe finishes Hermanson while he's clinging to like a desperation takedown or going for like a desperation leg lock or something. And Pfeiffer's just like hammer fisting him to the side of the head. Ref jumps in and this thing is over. And, you know, get ready for a hilarious slash inspiring slash tear jerking, uh, uh, you know, moment on the mic afterwards and just another star making moment for Joe Pfeiffer, but I would not be sleeping at all on the upset potential here. Like Hermanson, the best word for Hermanson is tricky. He's a tricky, tricky guy. Uh, and yeah, if, if Pfeiffer isn't there mentally, the, the, the upset potential is all over this one, but give me Pfeiffer by second round TKO. Yeah, this, this is, I, I'm glad that you said that you're like conflicted on this pick. I didn't even know who the favorite was going to be because, you know, part of me saying, well, you know, Piper is going to be the favorite because of, you know, the hype with him right now, the new kid in the box, the excitement about him. And then the other part of me said, no, it's going to be Hermanson because this is such a step up in competition for him, you know? So Hermanson, he's not a great athlete, but he's technically sound. He's and the biggest part of his game is he's so intelligent. He usually gives himself the best chance of winning despite not always being the most talented guy in the cage. Yeah. He's a he's a builder who, you know, his output picks up when his opponent starts to fade. He's a technically sound striker that moves really well. He's very good at landing strikes and then getting out of the pocket before being countered. He is good at changing up his rhythm so it's hard to time him. Uh, he he just touches at times and then unloads when there's opening. So he just kind of conserves his energy that way. His boxing's tight. 
doesn't overthrow. Now he doesn't. He he lacks one punch power. That's like the big weakness of the game. He's not. He's not really. He's not gonna really start you. Uh, he 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 attacks from different angles. He's good at cutting angles and good variety in his attacks. He's got a good kicking game. Great calf kicks. He likes those like mean John Jones oblique kicks. The issue is he has been hurt a lot. Um, because I mean, he's faced, he's been in the UFC top of the middleweight division for a while now. So, and I think about like, he, he, you know, he, he beat Jock Ray, but still got hurt in the fight. He beat Chris Curtis. He still got hurt, uh, specifically to the body and, um, Jock Ray. And I'm going back a while, but like Jock Ray was able to force her Manson on his back foot and he had trouble. Uh, Sean Strickland would beat him with just throwing a crisp jab in his face. Uh, he's got, he's got a solid chin. So, like, I don't want you to think I'm saying that he's, you know, shot or anything like that. And his durability is going, that's not the case. We're saying he's taking some damage. Uh, he is a great wrestler. All right. Since he's great, he's a very good wrestler. Yeah. Um, he's out grappled guys who are known for their grappling. Guys like Tialis Lates, Jock uh, Edmund Shabazian. Um, that he took down Marvin Vittori a lot, who just, yeah, not really known for his grappling, but just such a big dude. And I mean, he's got six subs on his record. And you, you know, only really Kelvin Gaslam was the time he looked bad on the ground. And that was like one brief moment. Uh, Piper, you know, he's a massive dude. Like, I can't believe he makes the weight class. He, you know, he looks like a guy that might just grow out of weight because he's so big. What I like about this kid is his confidence right now. He had, yeah, you know, I've always believed confidence is a huge key in, in sports, the mental aspect we don't talk about enough. It's it's the reason why guys like Tom Brady and Tiger Woods and Kobe Bryant, you know, insert superstar player who they just believe they're gonna succeed in all situations. They don't have that moment where, you know, we're supposed to be nervous like crazy. Now I'm not comparing him to those guys. I'm just saying like that confidence that he has. He has a chip on his shoulder like that. This is not a big step up in competition from that. He's gonna succeed at the at this level. He's a boxer. He marches down his foe. Great jab. He follows up with power shots down the pipe, attacks with the combination. His left hook is really good. Uh, I like that he goes to the body, throws some serious heat. He's got some serious power. Now, he will sometimes um, throw too many power shots, which is concerning, like not pacing himself. Um, I like his kicks. He's not really like, thudding leg kicks. He's an underrated wrestler himself. Nice entries, very physically strong, kind of, you know, grab a high crotch, lift and slam, sl slick grappling. Uh, been competing at a lot of grappling tournaments, which I like to see. Uh, some slick back takes. Um, his head and arm triangle choke was super slick in his in his last fight. Uh, so he, and he has three subs on his record. This is this is a really good fight. Um, I believe Piper is is one of the best props in, in the division. I think he is legit. Well, Hermanson, I mean, the dude's one of the craftiest underrated fighters in the game for a long time now. I think it's so disrespectful to Hermanson to be this big of an underdog. To me, it's at worst, it should be a pick -em, or even Hermanson, like slightly a favorite. Uh, Hermanson's going to do his best to kind of play the cat and mouse game and see if, you know, I'm expecting him to do that where, where you know, try to force for to chase him and either walks into counter shots or he walks right into takedown attempts. Um, it, that could happen, but I also think there's a good chance that Piper cuts off the cage and, and doesn't really chase him and just kind of forts the action. I think we have a back and forth fight. I think we have re both guys having moments, both guys getting takedowns, landing shots, getting reversals. I think we got a war in our hands. I'm going to stick with my guy, and I'm going to say they both have moments, but this is ultimately a pass passing of the torch, like an invitation to the big leagues. Uh, I see Piper land something late in the fight in a, in a really fun back-and-forth contest. Give me Piper my fourth-round TKO. I would love to see Piper have to go past the third round. Well, I'd, I think it's going to happen. Just, I, mean, I just picked this. So yeah. I think, obviously, I think it's going to happen. I hope it does. I, I want a war. I, I, don't, I don't want I want an absolute war. You know what Pfeiffer looks like? Like, 
if they they made like a biopic about Bo Nickel, but the producers are like, okay, so give me a guy like that, like this tall, pale yeah. guy with a wingspan and red hair, but give, give me a scarier looking one than yeah, yeah, than like Bo's eyes, not scary looking enough. Yeah, yeah, like like Piper's like the, they cast Bo Nickel in in a movie. <laughs> you're getting you're getting Joe Piper, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and you know what? If if he's of as good course. as we think he is. Or they make a movie about Bo Nickel, and he's like, you know, this nice Christian guy, and they have like his meaner brother, the the, the, <laughs> the like backslidden brother. <laughs> yeah, the the one who had sleep in his car for a year. Yeah, yeah. Like, uh, dude, if, if Piper's the real deal, like you and I both cautiously think he is, and Nickel is the real deal, as we obviously oh. believe here in in the Church of Bo, these guys are going to meet with high stakes sometime in the next oh, three absolutely. years. Absolutely. I hope not, because I like both the guys, but yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 good for the division and good for the UFC, but it, just as long as it's not on the way up, like once you, once you hit the top of the mountain, yeah, I mean, all bets are off. But um, this they're, is a they're huge twenty-seven one, man. and twenty-eight, man. They, they, it feels like they are ten years younger than like this is a huge one. Division. This this could be one of these. I mean, this is such a step up the competition. Like this could be like the like a a trivia question on on one of those like. Uh, those highlight, like one of those YouTube videos that people make, like uh, what's that one? They're really good. Um, MMA on point. Like this could be like one of those like yeah. hype, yeah. hype killing matches, and all, all of a sudden her man just kills the hype too. No, I I, I love uh, uh, Hart, uh, Hartley from uh, MMA. Yeah, 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 that's yeah, the guy, I, think, yeah. I think he's great. Uh, no, and I mean really, these two guys and uh, Vitor Petrino, who's also like just twenty nine himself. Like I, I think I mean one of them might fall off, not quite get to the heights, but sure. at least two of these, two of those three guys are going to fight for titles in this division. Yeah, well, Jack or Manson might change. I, I'm, I'm not as I don't, I'm even, not, I don't feel if as Manson, confident as you are. I'm not even if you are. even if Manson beats Pfeiffer. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like, yeah, yeah. I'm not saying all three of them stay undefeated for the next five years, but yeah, yeah. If, if, I, if you lose to Jack or Manson right now, it's not a career crusher. No. Not, not at all. Her Branson is a tricky, tricky man. Well, that is it. The Sherdog sure Radio Network preview for UFC Fight Night 236, Hermanson versus Pfeiffer. I have been Ben. He's been Keith. If this is your first time watching or listening to one of our previews, thank you. We hope you enjoyed it. Uh, we do our best to bring a mix of in-depth analysis and the occasional historical aside or random gag. Uh, please do hit the like, subscribe, uh, drop us a comment. None of those things cost you a thing and they make us feel real good. Keith and I both work those comment sections. So if you've got takes on these fights, uh, we'd love to hear from you about them. And if you think we're totally uh, off our rockers with any of these picks, uh, each of us picked at least one pretty big underdog. Let us know, because if you're right, we will give you all your flowers on the recap. Uh, we're live on the SureDog YouTube page about 10 minutes after the main event. Keith takes the captain's chair. We'll talk about all 14 of these fights from the headliner all the way down to that first uh, prelim, talking about what was good, what was bad, what was surprising, what was controversial. There's always something, hopefully not quite as bad as UFC Vegas 85 last week, but uh, talking about what's next for some of the notable winners as well as losers and talking with you. The live chat is open that whole time. So we are taking your questions, your comments, and your hot takes in real time. We have a growing community of friends that hang out with us after the fights, and we would love for you to be part of it. Between now and then, thank you once again for listening. Enjoy the rest of your week, and by all means, enjoy these fights. Yeah.